Welcome to Mystery Theater. I'm Hyman Brown. Probably the greatest English writer of the last century could be the novelist H.G. Wells. Wells has lifted our imaginations with The First Men on the Moon, War of the Worlds, The Invisible Man, and so on. With extraordinary resourcefulness and creativity, he has brought life to the incredible. And today, we have taken his words from the page, placed them in your ear, so that you can actually believe you are in the outlandish world of H.G. Wells. Professor Lidget, can you make out the school desks and the school children? Yes, I can. And I do. From here, they look phosphorescent. Luminous, don't they? They do look strange, Platner. And that explosion blew us a considerable distance away. I must get back to the school and take charge. Well, Professor Lidget, I, I don't think that'll be possible. Why not, indeed? Because I think that you and I are dead. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Watcher of the Living, adapted from a story by H.G. Wells, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Tony Roberts. I'll be back shortly with Act One. What will it be this time, Mr. Wells? Mars colliding with Earth? A machine to put you in another century? The problems of loving and living when no one can see you? None of the above? Something completely different. Yes. In fact, in the 90 years of science fiction that followed where H.G. Wells blazed the trail, no one has ever attempted to duplicate the story we tell you now. My name is Fred Plattner. I'm 27. My mother and father passed away when I was 10. I'm a teacher at a small school in Sussexville. So small that one teacher has to do the work of five. Too much work for too little pay. Last week, I heard of a great summer job in town, lifeguard on Sandy Beach. To apply, I first had to get a physical checkup. Mr. Platner, I do not have good news for you. I'm sick, uh, Dr. Bender? No, I, I wouldn't say that. Not sick, but uh, strange. Uh, you mean when you examined me, you found some... I didn't want to say anything until I had the x-rays, but I can tell you this. In all my years of general practice, I have never seen a body like yours. Oh, well, uh, will I live? Who knows? Uh, before I show you the x-rays, tell me, young man, why do you want to be a lifeguard? I understand you have an eminently scholarly position as a teacher. Uh, that's what everyone tells me, doctor. But there's no money in it now and no future in it tomorrow. What do you teach? <laughs> what don't I teach? <laughs> Bookkeeping, geography, modern languages, and chemistry which Dr. Lidget, our former principal, threw at me about a month ago. Aye, all those subjects. You must have a vast knowledge. No, I don't. But since my students begin by knowing nothing, all I have to do is bone up from day to day and stay one lesson ahead. What an extraordinary way to run a school. <laughs> In a town of a thousand persons and one and a quarter children per household, I was told by Professor Lidget, the principal, there was no alternative. There are two other teachers besides myself, and that's it. On my present salary, I can hardly save a cent. But if I pass the physical and get this lifeguard position, I could clear $300 this summer. I wish I could help you, Mr. Platner, but the facts don't help me. Uh, let me show you. Uh, look at these, your x-rays. First, notice... Your heart beats on the right side of your body. Now look at this plate. That is the right lobe of your liver. However, 
It's on the left side, and the left lobe is on the right side. Uh, tell me, have you noticed any changes in yourself lately? Well, now that you mention it, I have been finding it sort of difficult to write straight across a page the way I used to. You've stopped writing? How do you correct papers? Using my left hand and writing across the paper from right to left. Anything else, Mr. Platner, out of the ordinary? Well, I was never very good at sports, but now I can't throw a ball with my right hand at all. With your left? Not far. And sometimes I get confused at mealtimes, trying to find my knife and fork. I've caught myself quite often trying to cut my meat with my fork and putting it into my mouth with my knife. I'm backwards, is that it? What should be on your right side is on your left. You're sure I haven't always been that way? I asked myself the same question. So I got out your old x-rays from Dr. Jonas's files. The last time you came for a checkup, everything was in its proper place. I wonder... I have a theory, Mr. Platner, uh, which is not easy to substantiate how this might have occurred to a person. Uh, but my theory could hardly apply to you. It couldn't? There's a mathematical hypothesis that the only way a solid body can be changed is by taking that body clean out of space, as we know it, and inverting it. Oh, my gosh. Much further into space than any astronauts have ever gone, of course, into the fourth dimension, in fact. Uh, but that is a theory, and you, Mr. Platner, are a fact. Obviously, your internal exchange of left for right was not the result of any voyages into the fourth dimension. Oh, but they are. I mean, uh, they could be. You have made such a trip? I have. I was hoping to keep it a secret. Uh, my dear young man, look, getting a job this summer as a lifeguard isn't that important. Oh, but I did. Two weeks ago. I mean, I returned from wherever I was two weeks ago. Didn't you hear about my disappearing from the school? You see, that's where I must have been. In that fourth dimension. Mr. Platner, you're not feeling chilly or flushed, are you? No, I'm fine. So you took a trip into space, did you? Well, I don't know where I was, but I, I certainly wasn't in Sussexville. Mr. Platter, I imagine the tests have been a bit exhausting, so uh, if you'll come into the next room, do uh, you just stretch out on this couch, close your eyes, and rest up a bit? But I'm not tired. Uh, for your own sake, I think lying down won't hurt. You know, when you speak of traveling to other dimensions, even if you can't be a lifeguard this summer, I'd hate you to lose your teaching job because they thought... You've lost your mind. Of course, I couldn't really blame Dr. Bendener for thinking somehow I'd become unscrewed. And as I lay down in his ante room, those nine days in nowhere came back to me. Nine days I'd never forget. It began on a Tuesday night after chemistry class. Why are you still here, Platner? The bell rang. What are all these boys still doing here? They haven't all been kept in, have they? Uh, Professor Lidget, uh, <clears throat> Carson here uh, found some green powder up in the old lime kiln. So I told the boys if they'd like to take part in some scientific research, stay after class. And we'll subject the green powder to some scientific tests. Ah. Uh. Oh, uh, proceed then, Platner. I shall watch with interest. Uh, you don't mind if I stand beside you at the table here? No, 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 not at all. Uh, Professor Lidget, we're conducting this experiment to impress upon these boys, uh, Jacoby, Goodman, O'Shea, and, and Carson, that curiosity is not something that should stop after one has left school. So... Here is a medicine bottle containing green powder, courtesy of Billy Carson, and uh, plugged with a masticated piece of newspaper. Uh, plugged with what? Uh, a large spitball. First, 
we place a small amount of the green powder into a test tube. Now, we hold the tube under the tap and see what effect is caused by water. Hm. No effect. No change in the substance whatsoever. As you can see, the powder does not even dissolve. Now, uh, we'll prepare a number of test tubes, filling them with a little of Carson's green powder, partially filling each, and then in turn, we'll test the green powder against nitric acid, sulfuric acid, uh, hydrochloric acid. Very disappointing. No results, no changes in the powder. The experiment has yielded us zero. Nix. Not. Well, boys, those are the hazards of science. Uh, why don't you set fire to some of the powder, Platinum? Light it? With a match? Mm, or a Bunsen burner. Boys, our principal, Professor Lidget, suggests a test by fire. Here we go. We knock a few grains from the bottle onto this slate on our lab table. Professor, would you oblige with a match? Oh, yes, happy to. Ah, it's smoking. The green powder is melting. the explosion, I was lifted off my feet and driven forcibly backwards. I wondered if I'd crashed through the wall or window of the chemistry lab. The next thing I knew, I was thrown to the ground. Pladner. Pladner, is that you? Professor Lidget, are you hurt? Well, I, I, I don't think so. Me neither. Uh-huh. Uh, my my face seems to be all right. <laughs> I still have both my ears, uh, hands, arms, and my feet. Oh, so am I, thank heaven. Uh, but uh, where's the school? Where are we? N- none of this countryside looks familiar to me. Look! Straight in front of us. Huh? Those figures. I know those boys. They're in my bookkeeping class. But how strange they look. Sort of gray and amorphous. Almost floating. Are those gray shapes there? Those are our students? I can see their lips move. They're talking. But I can't hear a word they're saying. And they're coming towards us. The one in front is Johnson. Gray. Heaven. He just walked right through you. I I know. And I didn't feel a thing. Did you notice how dark it is getting? Above us, the sky is jet black. The only light is that greenish glow on the horizon in those black hills. Where where are we? Well, I can still see the chemistry classroom, but seems to be receding, getting fainter. Yes, I can see it, too. Way off there. It's as though I had X-ray eyes and can see right through the walls. Uh, We must get back. We've been blown a considerable distance away. I must take charge. Well, I I doubt that that will be possible, sirs. As I analyze it, uh, A, no one sees us. B, no one hears us. C, the boys walk right through us. D, yet we appear whole and uninjured. E, to ourselves we are real, but the school seems unreal. Therefore, I would conclude, uh, ergo... What, 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 what? That you and I, Professor, are dead. Well, now, have we just heard from the living, or should I say, speaking dead? How's that for a first act curtain? The shape of things to come, things beyond have always intrigued men. 
if, as some philosophers believe, ours is a world of the dying, then the next could possibly be the world of the living. What it's like, we may find out when Mystery Theater returns shortly. An overworked teacher in a small grammar school explodes himself and the principal into... into what? He believes it's the world of the dead. But could he be someplace else, some in-between state? It's a land where everything is shades of gray and green. Remember, it was a green powder that caused all this, a fact that does not escape those left behind. Were you able to get any sense out of the boy, Dorothy? Well, Billy says it was a, a green powder he found, brought it to class, and his chemistry teacher blew himself up with it, and that he and the principal just plain disappeared, blown to bits, no trace of them, Jim. The doggone part of it is you'd think an explosion like that would make some kind of noise. Oh, it knocked out a wall, but none of the children were hurt. So Billy brought that green powder, huh? We could be in for a peck of trouble. Do, do you really think so? Our son brings an explosive to school. His teacher and the principal are blown away. They could hold us responsible. They could? We're his parents, and he's underage. I wonder which teacher it was. Oh, Fred Plattner. You remember him. They got Fred teaching chemistry? What does he know? No wonder everything went fluey. Oh, he's such a nice young man, too. No, I know that. No. Nope promise you won't say anything to Billy tonight. He was very fond of Fred, too. No. No, no, no. Don't, 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 Fred. Please, please, please don't. Jim. Jim. Wake up. Jim, what is it? Jim, wake up. Huh? Oh. Oh, Dorothy, I... I had such a nightmare. I, I was dreaming. Oh, don't that... tell me. Don't tell me. Why not? It was kind of crazy. I had a terrible dream, too, Jim. Fred Plattner. He came right into this room and he motioned for me to follow him downstairs. Oh. And then he took out a small medicine bottle with green powder in it and was trying to give it to me. And then suddenly, it was gone. I saw him, too. By the whole closet. I mean, in my dream... He was standing by Billy's bed, and he had that same bottle in his hand, and he was shaking his head. And then I, I woke up. Poor Fred. He was too young to die. It, it was like he was trying to tell Billy something. That's what Fred did to me in my dream. Made me feel he wanted to tell me something. So, here I am, Fred Plattner. Or maybe I should say I was Fred Plattner. Now I exist in this other world, and I'm trying hard to get through to the world I've been blown out of. To those incandescent, phosphorescent shadows of people and places I knew. It's very frustrating. Plattner, where the devil are we? Gee, I wish I knew, Professor Lidget. And I was watching you before walking down that steep hill and stopping, and then you were shouting at some rocks. Well, I was trying to get through to Jimmy Carson. No go. He can't hear me. There must be a way to communicate with our world. Cut through the invisible barrier that separates us. Uh, Platner, I, I think I'm getting a chill. Well, it's sitting in one place, Professor Lidger. Uh. Give me your hand. Yes. Oh. Up, up you go. Yes. Now, we'll get ourselves off this cliff. Down there, it may be warmer. Oh, thank you, my boy. I'll follow you. I don't think I valued you when you were teaching at Sussexville. Yes, that's good. That's good. One step at a time. It's never as steep as you think. Um, I'll have to tell you, Professor, I have no idea where we're heading. But at least we're moving, and that's the best way to keep warm. Fladner, you know what's even more terrifying? I can hear you, and you can hear me, but that's all. There's no sound in this place. 
The leaves are moving, but no sound. The wind is blowing. You, you, you can feel it, but you can't hear a thing. We came down this cliff, not one footfall, not a sound. It's all like some mad, silent movie. Not a sound anywhere. Jim, will you see who's at the door? I'm just clearing away the breakfast dishes. Billy was late getting off to school today. Honey, I've got to make tracks for work myself. Harry's been giving me the hairy eye lately, ever since that rumor went around town about Billy blowing up the school. Uh, oh, all right. Oh, hello, Sheriff. What can I do for you? Good morning, Jim. May I come in for a few minutes? Oh, sure. Is Billy home? Uh, who? Billy, your son. Oh, oh, yes. I, 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 I mean, no, 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 no. Billy's in school. He loves school. Wouldn't miss a day. Now, maybe it's just as well. Uh, sit down, Sheriff. Uh, can I get you some coffee? No, thanks. Who is it, Jim? What? Hello, Sheriff. What brings you here this early? I'll get to the point. You all know about that explosion at the school? Why, yes, I did hear something about that. An uh, accident in the chemistry lab or something, eh? We've been investigating, and I'm not so sure I can call it an accident. Fred Flatner and Professor Lynchett have... <laughs> yes, that's a shame. We've questioned every boy who was in or near that class, Jim, and they all say the same thing. Well, Billy didn't mean anything by it. Honestly, he didn't. Dorothy, shut up. I, I, I mean, dear, let the sheriff tell us what's on his mind. I intend to. The information we've gathered is that your son brought a green powder into the class laboratory, and it was that that caused the explosion. A green powder? Well... Where could Billy have found such a thing? He never said anything about it to us, did he, dear? Jim, I think we should tell the sheriff. Well, there's nothing to tell. You asked where your son could have gotten such a powder. Three boys were with him when they all went to the lime kiln. He found it there and put it in the bottle. Oh, what three boys? Ted Jacoby, Matthew Goodman, and Tommy O'Shea. Well, I know those kids. They'll say anything. You know how kids are. You're not going to believe the word of little kids, are you? Unfortunately, we have no adult witnesses. But as we piece the story together, this was no ordinary school experiment. Well, I don't see how you could hold my boy responsible for the mistakes of a teacher. So far as you know, then, Jim, this whole story about Billy and the green explosive is untrue? Absolutely. Is this Billy's school satchel? Yes, it is. Where did you find it? In the chemistry lab, under one of the seats. I'll be straightforward with both of you. We found traces of a green powder inside. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to have to ask you, Jim, to come along with me back to the station house. Well, I can't go there now. I'm due at work. I'm afraid you haven't got any choice, Jim. But what have I got to do with it? The law says that since Billy is underage, you, his father, are responsible. I have to book you, Jim. Book me? On what charge? Accessory to murder. Several days and nights went by in our green world. This particular morning when I awoke, Large, strange snowflakes were dropping all over me. Green snowflakes. And then, for the first time, the stillness was broken by a sound. Platinum, you hear that? Ah, Bell. I think it comes from way down there in the gorge. Uh, let's get down there. Maybe there are people or someone who can help us. Oh, beautiful. Platinum, do you hear that? Hear what? The sound of our own footsteps. Things are starting to be a little bit more normal. 
And it's not so cold down here. Mm. Mm. Look at those gray craters. Will you look at that? I never. A great stone building. There's an entrance. Let's go on in. Wait a minute, Platner. Isn't there something wrong about it? Something peculiar? Well, nothing more peculiar than finding any gray skyscraper in a green world. It doesn't have any windows. It's like being inside a huge tomb. There are some flickering lights way down there. An altar. Something's moving back there. Where? To the right of the altar. What looks like a torch burning a green flame. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Now, follow along the walls where that strange writing runs around the side. All the way to the right. Snowflakes. Big as a balloon moving up and down. Let's get closer and have a look. No, I, I think I'll stay back here. If I go forward, Professor, you'll be alone here. Oh. Those large things. Their heads, floating heads, with, with sort of tails hanging from each one, like giant tadpoles in the air. They don't seem to have faces. Hey, one is turning around. It's got eyes. The others are turning now, too. They do have faces. Look at them now. They're floating away. Uh, anyone here? Uh, something just flew into my face. Something cold. It's, it's, it's one of them. Who are you? Who are you? Gladner, I don't think I can take much more of this. Look back. What do you see? I see the school. Our school. The big assembly hall. And the boys are taking a test. Uh, the midterms, that's what they are. Well, will you look at that? Some of them are using a crib. A pony. So they are. Cheating in a midterm. Platner, make a note which boys are cheating. No, well, I don't see the school anymore. It's changing now. I can see a street. Is it... Yes, it's Main Street. So it is. How can we see Main Street from here? Because it runs right through us. Uh, this world, this dimension. So that's where they went. Who went? Those floating faces. They're hovering over the people walking on the street, see? Look, one or two following each person. Watching. Watching? Why are they there? They're watching the living. Platna, where are you? I'm here. I just don't want to look anymore. Oh, what's the matter with you? you? You're crying. I know what those watchers of the living are doing. I know who they are. There are two of them above my head, aren't there? Yes. A man's face and a woman's face. I know them. I know who they are. The two faces over your head, you know them? It's my mother and father. H.G. Wells asks, who are these watchers of the living? Why do they so passionately watch those they have left forever? Is it that when our life is over, and evil or good are no longer a choice, that we may still have to watch the consequences of what we began? If this is so, then certainly Fred Platner and Professor Ligette have not died, but have invaded that dimension which hangs over all of us. Mystery Theater will continue shortly. Let H.G. Wells continue his story. If human souls continue after death, then surely human interests can continue after death. 
So these watchers of the living keep an eye on earthlings. Make note that this in-between land is green, the color of renewal, of continuation, of movement. Therefore, this island in space and time into which our two men have stepped could be a moving platform. But to where? How many days has it been, Platner? No, how many times did I go to sleep and wake up? Uh, six, seven, eight? I can't be sure. We have only you to blame for this. I seem to remember that it was you, Professor, who said, why don't you set a match to the powder? Why do these infernal things have to hang around us? What have I done to them? Well, go, go on, get away from me. Go away. Do you hear me? I... I don't see how you stand these floating heads always following us, bumping us like balloons with faces. I am trying to be calm and not let myself go, and you must do the same, Professor. I could just as easily lose my nerve, but how would that help me? Hmm. Listen. They've stopped. You're in a different spot than I am, Platner. Your mother and father are watchers. I hope you never see your parents as I'm seeing mine. Not being able to speak to them and be understood. Not knowing whether they are real or shadows. No, no. I absolutely refuse to be fingerprinted and that's final. You have a right to call your lawyer. Where are the bodies? Where's Fred Platten? Where's the headmaster, Professor Lidget? How can you be sure they aren't still somewhere, wandering about in shock, maybe, but very much alive? If in over a week they haven't shown up? Amnesia. Do you know what that is, Sheriff? If I were blown up in some ridiculous experiment, it would addle my brains, too. They're alive, I bet you, but they don't know who they are or where. Well, that all may be true, but you're still responsible for what happened. Speak to the mayor if you want to, but you're not leaving here until formal charges are placed. It had all changed between Professor Lidget and myself. No longer were we of like mind in this limbo of the dead where there was no sunrise or sunset, where a green haze hung over vast cliffs and stone buildings without windows. We were enemies, and that didn't help. The day I hired you for the school, I must have been mad, Platner. You got us into this. Now, what are we going to do? Try to keep my head, for one thing. For another, I am going to sit here and have another try at getting through to Sussexville. Oh, you have a formula? How are you going to do it? Concentrate. Mother, father, help me see our town. There. I can see right through that rock face. The walls of the house. Like glass. Well, Professor, you got your wish. There's Billy Carson and his mother. They're standing in the kitchen listening to the telephone. There's unhappiness written on her face. I shouldn't wonder. That boy shouldn't be allowed out alone. He's a menace. They're talking to someone at the police station. Mother, father, I want to see what is happening there. Dorothy, honey, don't cry. They won't let me go home right now. I, I've called our lawyer. He's in court, but he'll get over here as soon as he can. Now, you just tell Billy what trouble he's caused. I don't know when I'll get home. I, I'll get there... I want to get there. That's all I know. This way, Mrs. Vandermill. I don't know what possibly could have come over that sales girl. I mean, to actually accuse me. Now, Mrs. Vandermill, there's nothing I can do. Maybe something did happen to fall off the perfume counter into my purse, but heavens to say I was shoplifting. Me, Helena Vandermill, why, I own half this town. Why would I ever steal anything? Uh, they did find some merchandise in your handbag. Oh. oh, who is that man sitting over there? He's in our custody. He's waiting for his attorney. 
Now, Mrs. Vandermill, if you'll kindly pay the fine, all the formalities will be taken care of. Oh, Sheriff, you are the most understanding public servant in this town. The fine, Mrs. Vandermill? Oh, yes, of course. Now, how, how much will it be this time? I'd say $50 would govern. Oh, $50 it is. Here you are. All I have with me is 20 so here are three and... Do keep the change. Thank you, Mrs. Vanderman. Yes, I'll be more careful next time and keep my bag closed. Who was that? The richest old gal in town. But I have to haul her in at least once a week. She can't help shoplifting. Oh, why didn't you arrest her? Oh, I couldn't do that. Oh, why did you slip her fine in your pocket? I keep it safe there. Understand? Yeah, I'm beginning to. And how much would a little understanding cost me? Mr. Carson, I mean, Jim. I knew you'd understand the way we do business around here. I'm sorry I was a little slow. Uh, let me see what I have in my wallet. The crookedness in our town. I had no idea... Starting with boys cheating on their exams, all the way to the police taking bribes. Lidget and I had stopped talking. I was too tired one evening to keep my eyes open, and before I knew it, I was asleep. Platner! Platner, get up! Huh? Huh? What? What's the matter? Get up! Oh, yes, certainly. <sighs> Professor, what are you holding that rock in your hand for? I'm not staying here any longer. Well, how do you propose to leave? You're going to lead me back to the exact spot where we entered this other world. Oh, I don't know that I remember it. Well, you'd better, if you don't want your head bashed in. Professor Lidget, I understand the strain you feel, but what good will it do you to hurt me? I don't care anymore. I've got to leave here. All right, all right. Let's start up this path and see if I can find the place. Hello, operator. I dialed five 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 one two one two, and I got a wrong number. Would you place the call for me, please? It's the mayor's office. <laughs> it works every time. Uh, good morning, Mayor. Not too badly. We made $260. 60 from the old klepto, and I nicked another citizen for the 200 All right, will you stop by, or shall I send the cash over to the town hall? Good. I'll put 130 in an envelope addressed to you and marked official business. That little scene at conniving didn't escape me either. It made me wonder, did I really wish to return to the life I had grown up with? We climbed and finally reached a plateau which I thought looked familiar. Is this where we first landed? Are you sure? I'm as sure as I can be. You know, Professor, that world of ours, it's not what it's cracked up to be. No, no it isn't. But it's the only game in town. And people aren't what they think they are. Platner, you're still carrying that glass bottle with some green powder. Yes, I still have it. What's left? Why? Nothing. Just thinking. Hmm. It's finally dawned on me why the watchers of the living have such unhappy faces. What goes on on earth is enough to make anyone sad. Greed, deceit. Where people you thought were honorable, people you respected. Even you, Lidget. You're much less of a human being than I thought you were. Much less. Lidget, what are you doing with that rock? Lidget, please... Please! I came to on Earth. 
lying sprawled out in the schoolyard, covered in scratches and bruises. I was alone. Professor Lidget didn't get back to Earth with me. I, I remembered running away from the professor, and uh, then I tripped and fell. Yes, the powder must have exploded on impact, and here I was. It was getting dark in Dr. Bendener's office, and I remembered I'd come to see him for a physical. Feeling any better, Mr. Platner? Yes, I, I, I am. I'm fine now, Doctor. Had a little sleep? Oh, uh, not exactly. I'm uh, just thinking about how my insides got all reversed. Nothing's malfunctioning, you understand. Just exchanged. Are you up to getting yourself home? Now, Dr. Bendener, I've decided I don't want to be a lifeguard after all. I'm just not the swimming kind. I didn't know there was any other kind. Oh, there are lots of ways lives can be guarded. Uh, I'd like to think about that. <laughs> think about what, Mr. Platner? Uh, yeah, what I ought to do uh, now that I'm back. Back? Uh, go back uh, to teaching. I think you should. Oh, well, they say that those who can do, uh, those who can't teach... I think I can, Doctor. And there's an awful lot of doing that Sussexville needs. Maybe I'll just give it a try. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. Some folks around Sussexville are still scratching their heads wondering where Fred Platner and Professor Ligette disappeared to for nine days and why the professor never came back. But Fred isn't telling anyone. Every now and then, though, he'll look up suddenly as if he was seeing someone he recognized. Who knows? Perhaps we are all being watched. Our cast included Tony Roberts... Bob Dryden, Bryna Rayburn, and Gilbert Mack. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then. Pleasant dreams. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. If it works, it's obsolete. So says Marshall McLuhan. Alas, he must be speaking of other endeavors than crime. For in crime, if it works, it's up to the law to find a way to stop it as quickly as possible. But the clever criminal resists detection with every means at his disposal, fair or foul. And that puts the law at a distinct disadvantage. One must rely on clues. But what if the criminal has invented a new method of crime? One in which what is obsolete is the evidence. Sheriff, what brings you out here again? There's been another murder, Professor. Another? Like the first one? Yep. But that's two murders in two days. Isn't there anything you can do? No. We've got the bodies... We have the murder weapons. We can even construct a reasonable theory why the murders were committed. But the thing is, I got a feeling none of this is going to lead us to the murderer. Our mystery drama, The Dominant Personality, was written especially for the mystery theater by Percy Granger and stars Roberta Maxwell. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Mm -hmm. 
Imagine a rural area in the northern United States, an area so remote, the only roads are old logging trails, an area of glacial lakes, dark forests, where the population is so sparse, every house is an isolated outpost. In the summer, the tourists come to boat and fish, but with the fall, they return to the city, and those few who remain, the natives, settle back into solitude. Such existence breeds persons of marked character, capable of coping with any situation, that is, with almost any situation. Rod? Hey, hey, Rod! Rod, you home? Oh, his car's back. He must be... Rod, where the heck are you... Yes? Oh, Oh, excuse me, ma'am. I-, I was looking for Rod Talbert. My name's Olivia. Oh, I'm Murdoch Ross. I- I- I'm the county sheriff in these parts. I just dropped by to check on Rod's cabin since he's been gone. Would you like to come in? Well, is Rod here? He went for a walk. He'll be back soon. Oh. Thank you. I, uh... I-, I was just trying to get a fire going in the fireplace. I'm not very good at it. Well, you don't have enough kindling. And those logs, that, that's hardwood. You ought to use something like birch or popple. Thank you. I guess it'll take me a while to learn everything. I'm going to have to know. Say, uh, excuse me for asking, but uh, are you a friend of Rod's? I'm his wife. His wife? I never knew Rod was married. He wasn't. We were married yesterday. <laughs> Where? Down in the city. Well, <laughs> that's something. All these years, Rod's had a girlfriend and never said a word. Of course, he's not the kind to share confidence. No, we only met two weeks ago. What, two weeks? <laughs> well, I guess it does seem a little strange, but we were attracted to each other right off. It just seemed the natural thing. There. Is the fire better now? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You want me to light it? No, I want to do things for myself. I've lived all my life in the city. Everything's so safe and predictable there. (laughs) Sure is funny. What is? Well, Rod getting married. I don't know anyone who's more of a loner than him. You know what we call him? The Great Gatsby of the North Woods. No one knows where he's from or why he came to live up here. How long has he lived here? Well, let's see, it's nearly seven years now. (laughs) Strange fella. But, of course, he must have told you a few things about himself. No. (laughs) I fell in love with his eyes. His eyes? (laughs) Sounds silly, I guess, but it's true. I was working as a waitress. Not much future in that. I must have seen a hundred people a day sitting at that counter. Then Rod came in. Other men had looked at me that way, but with Rod it was different. He didn't say much at first, but he kept coming back. He never stopped looking at me. Then he started telling me about this cabin and the lake and the woods. It all sounded so beautiful. I never would have figured when he disappeared like that three weeks ago. He'd gone to town to get himself a wife. (laughs) Say, he got that fire going pretty good now. Uh, Listen, I I don't want to stick around here on your your honeymoon. Uh, You tell Rod I'll be by to see him tomorrow. Is something the matter? Well... What is it? I'm afraid Rod's got a problem with some of the folks around here. Really? But we're so isolated here. There's not another house within a mile. Yeah, well, like I say, Rod's a real loner. He he just don't seem to like other people. He's got a habit of running trespassers off his land at gunpoint. Rod does that? Yeah. One neighbor in particular, a fellow named Shep Taylor, kept a dog. Uh, Rod claimed he could hear the barking through the woods. He was always making threats. And then about a month ago, just before Rod disappeared, someone poisoned the dog. And it died? Yep. Anyhow, now Taylor's gone out and bought himself a new dog, and well, I don't want any more trouble. Maybe now that we're married, all that will change. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Let me pay visits to the neighbors. When there's so few people around, it's silly not to get along. Well, there's uh, Shep Taylor and a widow named Mrs. Booker. She's kind of a hermit herself. And then down the road in the other direction is uh, Leo Hertel. 
he's from the city, too. He, he was a professor of psychology at the university uh, until he decided to drop out of society and come up here. He sounds interesting. Yeah, he's got a whole cabin full of books. <laughs> well, it's going to be a cool evening. You ought to sleep good up here. I'll walk you to your car. It's nearly dark. I wonder where Rod is. Well, he didn't say where he was going. He said he needed to go into the woods for a while. Hey, you're not afraid of being left alone, are you? Oh, no. This is an adventure. Oh! Oh! What's that? Oh, that's a loon. You'll hear them a lot up here. What a lonely sound. Now, good night, Mrs. Talbert. Good night, Sheriff. What did he want? Rod. <laughs> what was Murdoch doing here? He came by to check on the cabin. You should have seen his face when I answered the door. Why was he checking the cabin? Well, to make sure everything was all right, I guess. He seems like a very nice man. He's okay. I'm glad you're back. Where did you go? Just walking. Through the woods, down by the lake. You love it out here, don't you? Yeah. I think it's even more beautiful than you described. Look at the autumn colors. And not another house in sight. Oh, what's that? Ah, uh, damn. Rod, what's the matter? That sounded like it came from Taylor's place. Rod, the sheriff said Mr. Taylor had a dog that was poisoned. So I heard. He said he's bought another. But it's not so bad. You can barely hear it. Let's go inside and make some supper. And then get some sleep. Oh, Rod? Good morning. Good morning. How'd you sleep? Oh, I don't know. I feel tired. Here, spice some water in your face. Oh, oh, it's cold. Oh, I don't know why I don't feel more rested. The sheriff said the cool air here knocks one right out. Well, maybe it just takes getting used to. Hello? Oh, who's that? Leo Hertel. He's an old professor who moved up here a few months ago. Oh, yes, the sheriff told me about him. Morning, Rod. Hello, Leo. Is this your new bride? <laughs> News travels fast. Well, not really. Murdoch stopped in to see me last night on his way back to town. My name's Olivia. I am pleased to meet you. You had breakfast yet, Leo? I know. Would you like to join us? Now that I've had my morning constitutional, I'd be delighted. Uh-huh. Who's this? It looks like the sheriff again. Oh, well, this is becoming quite the gathering place. Getting married certainly brings changes, all right? Well, what could the sheriff be doing out here at this hour? He said he wanted to speak to you about Mr. Taylor and his dog. Morning, everyone. Rod, Mr. Talbert. Fisher? Morning, Murdoch. Out a bit on the early side, eh? Shep Taylor's been murdered. What? Oh, no. What happened? He was found in his bed, bludgeoned to death. Otis Thompson came up from the lumber yard to make a delivery about seven this morning... He knocked, and when there was no answer, he went on in. Oh, that's terrible. I thought he'd got himself a new watchdog. Yeah. Wasn't any good, huh? The dog is dead, too. Labrador retriever. Fully grown. Strangled. Wow. So who did it? Yeah, I don't know yet. No idea. Thought since your property lies next to his, you might have heard or seen something last night. Not me. I was sleeping like a log. And Miss Talbert? I didn't sleep very well, but I wasn't awake. At least I didn't hear anything that I can remember. Maybe something disturbed you? I don't know. Thing is, whoever it was didn't come up by Taylor's Road. There are no fresh tracks except from Thompson's lumber truck. And the only other way to Taylor's cabin is along the path that cuts through your property, Ron. I told you, Sheriff, I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything. You think perhaps it was a hunter? Yeah, deer season doesn't open officially until tomorrow. Well, it could have been a poacher. 
Yeah, poachers don't generally leave trails. That's the problem. Now I'm going back into town to file a report. You want to lift back to your place, Professor? Yes, um, uh, Talbot's asked me to stay for breakfast, but I think maybe I should just take a rain check. Suit yourself, Leo. Of course. Uh, Mrs. Talbot, I'm sorry about this. It's not a very pleasant introduction to our community. Oh, Rod, this is awful. It's happened before. What do you mean? Seems like every five years or so, someone goes berserk around here. Why? Not enough to do. Cabin fever. Doesn't it bother you that that poor man is dead? Why should it? I couldn't stand the guy. Professor Hertel? Hmm? Oh, Miss Talbot. Oh, what a pleasant surprise. Am I disturbing you? No, no, I was just sitting out here reading an old book, but uh, a visitor around here, that's an event. Can I talk to you? Certainly. Is uh, something the matter? The sheriff said you used to be a professor of psychology. Yes. What is it? It's about Rod. I'm worried. I'm, I'm beginning to think maybe I don't really know him at all. We got married so quickly... But he seemed like the kind of person one could trust. He's certainly a good-looking fellow. But I think I've made a mistake, Professor. A terrible, terrible mistake. It may seem out of place at this point to quote the famous American humorist George Ade. But he once observed that those who marry to escape one thing usually find something else. However dull Olivia thought the routine she was shedding when she came under the spell of Rod Talbot, she may well have stepped into a situation even less desirable. Far less desirable. In fact, deadly. Mystery Theater will return with Act Two shortly. If you were ever arrested, to whom would you make your one phone call? If you were in trouble, to whom would you turn for help? What if you were far away from friends and family, far away from anyone you knew and could trust? What if, for example, you were in a lonely rural community where everyone was a stranger to you? And the most strange of all was the person who had brought you there, the person you had married. You think you've made a mistake, Mrs. Talbot? What kind of mistake? I don't think I should have come up here. I don't think I should have married Rod. I don't know what got into me. Got into you? The very first time I saw him staring at me, his, his gaze locked into me. I felt like I had no willpower of my own. I couldn't think clearly. It was as if I was under his control. Oh, I can understand that. He's a very good-looking man. I often wondered why he never got married before now. Uh, no, it's more than just his looks. He has some kind of power. Oh, it sounds to me like you're talking about love. No. And if you are, I'm afraid you're talking to the wrong person. I've never been married. I was so obsessed with my experiments and researches into the mind, I realized I was working myself into an early grave. That's why you moved here? Yes, this forest primeval, as Longfellow would call it is the furthest extreme imaginable from the bustle of university life. And now, at last, I'm free. But the murder of Mr. Taylor... I know. Shocking. Tragic. Didn't you notice yesterday when the sheriff came by and told us about it that, that Rod seemed totally unmoved by that man's death? Rod's not an easy person to get to know, and I haven't known him that long. I've only lived here a few months. But you don't think he killed Taylor, do you? I don't know what to think. All of a sudden, he seems so cold. Oh! Oh, that sound. The cry of the loon. It's so lonely. The Indians used to say the cry of the loon was like the cry of a woman lost in the woods. I'm beginning to know that feeling. Are you frightened? Yes. And tired. 
I slept so restlessly again last night. Doesn't that mean something? My my subconscious telling me what a terrible mistake I've made? Mrs. Talbot, I have been observing your husband. Frankly, he fascinates me. And I think I can tell you something about him. Please. He is what we psychologists call a dominant personality. What does that mean? A law of nature demands that human beings, just like any other animal species, have a pecking order, an order of dominance. It's been clinically proven that there is a small percentage of people who have the ability to lead others, to control them. These are people to whom the rest of us just naturally defer. Why? Oh, it could be due to any number of causes. Superior will, a stronger sense of purpose, but the point is... I don't think you need to worry that Rod has cast any mysterious sort of spell over you. But do you think he killed Mr. Taylor? I mean, if they were enemies, if if Taylor was getting on his nerves, if Rod is one of those dominant people, he wouldn't like it very much if his will was thwarted, would he? No. Has he ever told you anything at all about his past? No, he never discusses it. Why does he want such complete isolation from other people? And if he does... Why did he marry me? You're not thinking of leaving, are you? What if he plans to kill me, too? I think we're jumping to conclusions. You say you're frightened. Under the circumstances, I can't blame you, but I think there's someone who's even more frightened than you. Rod? Yes. I think he senses the power he has to exercise this remarkable influence over others, and I think it terrifies him. And that's why he tries to live as far away from others as possible? And why he never speaks of his previous life? Possibly. But if he's in hiding, if he did something... The point is, he went down to the city, he found you, he married you. To me, that's the behavior of a man who wants to change, to make a new start. But then why? You do love him, don't you? I don't know. You have some feeling for him. Yes. But that poor Mr. Taylor... Mrs. Talbot... Shep Taylor's dog, a full-grown Labrador retriever, was physically strangled. Do you really think Rod could do such a thing? I... I've heard stories about people going crazy and, and, and doing things like that. If you were married to a psychopath, I think you'd know it. But I understand your fear. Perhaps you would feel safer back in the city. No. I'm not going to give in that quickly. Mrs. Talbot, are you all right? You and Rod aren't the only ones who had their reasons for coming here. I'd better be getting back. Maybe I should walk with you through the woods? Thanks. But if I'm going to stay, I'd better get used to walking the woods alone. You understand, of course, that I have a purely selfish interest in wanting you to stay. Thank you. Professor Hertel, does Rod like you? I hope so. Why do you ask? The sheriff said it wasn't just Mr. Taylor. Rod's never been friendly towards anyone who lives nearby. But yesterday morning, he asked you to stay for breakfast. Well, Murdoch is fond of exaggerating. It's a habit with people up here when there's not much excitement. Rod's just like anyone else. He's a fine fellow if you treat him right. I'm back. Are you here? Morning, Mrs. Talbert. Sheriff. Pardon my coming on in. It's getting a bit chilly this time of year to wait around outside. I didn't expect you. I I didn't see your car. Oh, it's parked down by the main road. I came up through the woods. Is Rod here? No. I was just waiting for him myself. Certainly doesn't like spending much time indoors, does he? No. You got any idea where he might be? When I awakened this morning, he was already up and gone. Uh. Maybe he went hunting. Hunting? Now, the deer season opened today. Rod's real fond of stalking game. He didn't say anything to me about it last night. He just, uh, up and disappeared, huh? I guess he's still used to living alone. Yeah. yeah. I guess so. Why are you here? Because, Mrs. Talbert, there's been another murder. What? Yeah, found the body this morning. Was it? Was it someone who lived nearby? No. No, this one was a hunter from the city. Oh. Made camp down by the river on the other side of the road. 
Oh, but... But that land... That's the land that Rod owns. Yep. Was this man shot? No. No, he died the same way Taylor did. Bludgeoned. Obviously by a person of great strength. Now, some other hunters going upriver by boat spotted him at dawn this morning. I'm sorry. Well, I'm a mite more than that. Where is Rod, Mrs. Talbert? I don't know. I told you he wasn't here when I woke up. Where were you just now? I, um... I went to see Professor Hertel. A social call? He's a very nice man. Hmm. Is there anything you care to tell me, Mrs. Talbert? About what? Two murders in two nights. Don't have to tell you how it looks, do I? No. No. Now, I know Rod doesn't like trespassers, Mrs. Talbert. Oh, neither do I. But the penalty for trespassing is ordinarily not death. Do you have proof that Rod did it? No, no, nothing. Nothing concrete. There's no smoking gun, as we say. That's why I'm here. Are you a heavy sleeper? I don't know. Why? Yesterday morning you complained you had a bad night. Yes. And now how about last night? Why? I just thought you might have been kept awake by Rod's comings and goings. That's not fair. You have no proof against him. Why are you defending him, Mrs. Talbert? Why? That's what you're doing, you know. And it's real odd because... Now, if your husband is guilty, the one person who ought to have the most to fear is you. Hello. Rod. Where have you been all day? Out. Where? I was doing a little fishing over on the river. The river? Got us a nice bass for supper. Oh, um... But I don't know how to cook it. I'll show you. Get some scallions and uh, basil from the garden while I clean it. Rod, uh, could could we sit for a moment and have a talk? What about? About us? I mean, about why we got married? Sure. We really don't know very much about each other. We know what we see. What else is important? But what about your past? Where are you from? That doesn't matter. What made you decide to come and live up here? I don't like crowds. I don't like being dependent on others. Were you ever married before? Why? A woman likes to know things like that. Why? What difference does it make? Were you? Olivia, we'll get along fine if certain doors just remain shut. Why did you use that image? What image? About doors staying shut. What's the matter with it? It's like the story of Bluebeard and his castle with the door he tells his wife never to open. The door to the room where the bodies of all the other women he's married and murdered are. What's the matter with you? You crazy or something? If you don't like people, why did you marry me? I don't talk about feelings. Okay? How come you're so nervous anyway? If I'd known you were going to be so nervous, I never would have picked you. Rod, there was another murder last night. What? Down by the river, on your land. The sheriff was here. He wants to see you. He thinks I did it. Does he? Yes. Huh. I don't know anything about it. But I can tell you this much. I didn't do it. Now, come on. I'll show you how to cook this fish. And then we can go to sleep. everything 
I wanted you to. Olivia, can you hear me? Yes. Olivia, I want you to go out again tonight. I want you to go to the professor's cabin this time, Olivia. And I want you to kill him just the way you killed the others. And then you will come back here to bed. Do you understand? Do you understand? Farewell contentment. Farewell the quiet life. So said Desdemona when she realized she was hopelessly in love with the charismatic Othello. Olivia Talbot might well echo her words, for she too seems to have come under the spell of a powerful man. But if Rod has indeed mesmerized her in order to use her to create for himself a perfect solitude, then her plight is even more desperate than the fair Venetians. For at least Desdemona was able to enter into her marriage with her eyes wide open. Mystery Theater will return with our conclusion in a few moments. It is said that there is nothing new under the sun. But under the moon, oh, that's a different matter. The moon, Luna, was once believed to be the cause of insanity. It was said to control the dark, irrational side of man's nature. Today we know that isn't true. The only connection the moon has to the irrational forces in our story is that it is shining fitfully down on Olivia Talbot as she walks along a desolate country road. Hey! Hey! Hold it up there! Who is that? Mrs. Talbot. Mrs. Talbot. Yes? What the heck are you doing out here? I'm going to see the professor. L Leo? Leo Hertel, yes. Do, do you know what time it is? It's past midnight. I was just making a final patrol before heading back to town. That's nice. Say, you, you aren't in trouble, are you? Excuse me. I must keep going. Now, no, wait. What are you doing out here in your nightgown? Aren't you cold? Thank you. No. Mrs. Talbert, are you all right? Mrs. Talbert, wake up! Wake up! Uh, what? Uh, oh, oh, Sheriff. Where am I? You're out in the middle of the road, and it's oh. one o'clock in the morning. Oh, it's cold. Here, here. Uh, take my jacket. Oh, how did I get here? You look like you were walking in your sleep. Here, get, get into the car. Oh, oh uh, no, I, I don't think I should. Uh, why not? I, I, I shouldn't. Oh, come on, come on. It'll warm you up. There. Uh, slide on over. That's it. There. Uh, feel better? I, I feel nervous. Tell me, has this ever happened to you before? Uh, walking in your sleep? Uh, I, I don't think so. What's that thing you've got in your hand? What? Oh! Uh, oh! Uh, what is it? It's a whetstone with a wooden handle kind you'd use on a large blade. Let me see. Oh, it's, it's so heavy. What was I doing with it? The uh, question is, where did you get it? I don't know. Seems to me I recollect Rod having a whetstone like this. There's a tool shed behind our cabin, but Rod keeps it locked. You think you could have opened that lock in your sleep? No, I couldn't have done it because I don't know where he keeps the key. Mrs. Talbert... Why were you going to see Leo Hertel? Was I? That's what you said before I shook you awake. Why should I be going to the professor's house in the middle of the night? And with that implement in your hand. Sheriff, you don't think that uh, I... Now that Taylor is dead, Leo is Rod's closest neighbor. But I like him. But what about Rod? 
Rod likes him, too. I mean, he's, he certainly doesn't have anything against him the way he did with Taylor. You heard him the other day. He even asked him to stay for breakfast. I don't pretend to know what goes on inside that man's head, Mrs. Talbert. You don't think that Rod... But... But what... What did he do? Uh... Hypnotize me? Oh, that's not possible, is it? I don't know. I don't know what goes on these days anymore. I think you're making a mountain out of a molehill. If you're suggesting that I'm susceptible to hypnosis and that Rod has been using me to kill people. Would you like me to take you into town? Now? What for? Well, maybe you'd feel safer. I'm not afraid. You could stay with us, huh? Have my wife make up a bed for you? No. I want to go back to Rod. Why? I want to be with him. Look, Mrs. Talbot... I'm not afraid of him. Please take me home, Sheriff. That's where I belong. That's where I want to be. Come in. Professor? Murdoch. Is that you? Yeah. Oh, uh, just a second. I'll turn on the light. Sorry to wake you up at this hour. I think there may be a new development on the murders. Oh, no. Has someone else been killed? No. But if I'm right, there almost was. Who? You. Me? I found Olivia Talbert walking along the road just now. She said she was headed here. Mrs. Talbert. Look, I need your help, Leo. If I'm the next victim, you've got it, but... Mrs. Talbot. Uh, she seemed to be in some kind of a trance. And when I snapped her out of it, she acted confused. At first I thought she might have been sleepwalking. But then I noticed she was carrying a heavy whetstone. You mean something that could have been used as a weapon? Yes. Oh, dear. This is most distressing. I never would have believed. You think she was just pretending to be sleepwalking then? No. No, I think she was in a trance, all right. She wasn't properly dressed against the cold, but didn't bother her until I woke her up. Now, what I think is, Rod has been hypnotizing her. Well, that's a pretty fantastic proposition, Murdoch. Well, that's what I want to know. Now, you're a professor of psychology. I was. Is that kind of thing possible? Yes, theoretically, I suppose. It would depend on the powers of the dominant person and the suggestibility of the subject. But whoever's killing these people would have to be strong as an ox. Taylor's dog was strangled. Subjects often exhibit supernormal strength while under hypnosis. If that's what Rod's been doing, it's an impressive achievement. Uh, that's a purely clinical appreciation, of course. Where's Mrs. Talbot now? Well, she insisted I take her back to Rod's cabin. Really? Even though she realized what's happening? Yeah. I'm worried about her. On the other hand, if I'd taken her into town with me like I wanted to, I'd probably never be able to build an airtight case against Rod. How are you going to do that? Well, if you'll help me. Of course. I'm very fond of Mrs. Talbot. I don't want anything to happen that would hurt her. I'm going to go by there first thing in the morning. Now, I want you to appear while I'm there. If Rod thinks you're dead... And then sees you. Well, will you do that? What time? I'll get there at ten of eight. You come by at eight o'clock sharp. Olivia. Olivia. You returned much too quickly. I know. Did you do what I asked you to? I tried. Is the professor dead? No. Why not? I didn't go all the way to his cabin. You didn't listen to me. I don't want to people around me. I want to be rid of all of them. Do you hear me? Yes. I want you to go out again, Olivia. Now. And this time, 
I don't want you to fail. Come in, Olivia. I've been expecting you. I'm here. I'm glad. I had no way of knowing how many nights it would be before Rod would send you to me. Do you know why you're here? To kill you. Very good. I can't tell you how excited I am. This is my ultimate triumph. For years I have studied and experimented for this moment. And now at last it has come. Do you want me to kill you now? Oh, no, you're not going to kill me, Olivia. And do you know why? Because I am the one who really controls you. Rod is only a middleman. Do you understand? Do you realize what I have achieved? What? A month ago, I brought Rod under my power and ordered him to find someone like you. I have accomplished the ultimate feat of mind control. The absolute mastery of another human being. That makes me very happy. Anybody can hypnotize a suggestible person face to face. But to be able to invest that person with hypnotic powers of his own. To order him to find his own subject. And order that subject to commit murder. I have achieved something that anyone in my profession will tell you is impossible. But I have done it. I'm the dominant personality behind all this. Do you want me to kill you? Of course not. How obedient you are. What do you want me to do? It is time to bring my experiment to a safe conclusion. I am going to give you a gun. Yes. What? Do you want me to do with it? You and Rod are murderers, Olivia. You are evil people. Do you understand me? I want you to return to Rod's cabin. I want you to shoot Rod and then yourself. Once this is done, you will be forgiven. Thank you. I understand. I know you do. And now, Olivia, goodbye. You may go now. Hold it, Leo. What? Don't move, either of you. Murdoch. I had second thoughts about leaving Mrs. Talbert alone with Rod. So I went back, just in time to see her leaving the cabin again. And you followed her? That's right, Leo. And I heard it all. Mrs. Talbert, you can put that gun on the table now. Mrs. Talbert? Leo, tell her to put that gun down before she hurts herself. Olivia, point your gun. At the sheriff. Leo. Do as I say. Yes. Leo, tell her to lower that gun. Squeeze the trigger, Olivia. Squeeze it. Yes. No. At him, not. That nice man. Mrs. Talbert, will you give me that gun now? Are you all right? Oh. Oh, what have I done? He's dead. Do you know what happened? Yes. He told me I had to earn my forgiveness. Do you remember killing the others now? Yes. Oh, Sheriff. It's all so frightening. It's over now. It's all over. Oh. But the frightening thing isn't. The frightening thing will never be over. Huh? What's that? That I have such strength inside me. That I have such strength. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. At the final moment, 
Olivia Talbert turned her gun on the very man who seemed to have her under his total control. For there was one fact of human nature that Leo Hertel forgot. One fact that all his work discipline and evil power could not change. No person can will another to act indefinitely in contradiction to his nature. Our cast included Roberta Maxwell, Ralph Bell, Gordon Heath, and Charles Irving. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. in. Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. So many of you write me letters asking for stories of the occult, of strange death and wandering ghosts, of gothic horrors and unimaginable terrors. Yet, others write for a love story. It's much too simple and gentle an emotion to belong on Mystery Theater. Or is it? After all, it was love that inspired Victor Herbert's song, Our Sweet Mystery of Life. To reinforce that, here is a love story that is not so much of this life, but more the one beyond. Marta's got to retire, Max. Retire? One of the foremost concert pianists in the world? Her heart won't stand the strain anymore. Julie, Julie, she can't afford to retire. Well, with all the money she's made... It's all been spent looking for him. But her husband is dead. Everyone else realizes that. Except Marta Daninov. Our mystery drama, Love After Death, was written especially for the mystery theater by Ian Martin and stars Ralph Bell and Norman Rose. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Among the company of the great romantic pianists, the Chopins, the Rubensteins, and all the other towering geniuses, no name shone more brightly, although relatively briefly, than that of Marta Daninoff. Perhaps audiences were unduly affected by this wisp of a woman whose thundering crescendos seemed the physical impossibility and whose delicate pianissimos were marvels of projected whispers. What made this fair little woman able to run this gamut of romantic emotions? the banked-up fires of a raging and enduring love that tragedy and disaster and separation could never quench. Marta is magnificent tonight, Julie. Magnificent. I don't know where she finds the strength, Mr. Frank. Oh, banked fires. It comes from within. She's a true romantic. Her soul overcomes her body. But how much longer can it? What do you mean, Julie? But she's ill. Much sicker than she'll ever admit. It's sheer willpower that keeps her going. Well, it has been all her life. Well, if you care about her life, you've got to talk her into retiring. I have to? Well, you're her manager. Who well, else? You're her secretary. You're closer to her than anyone. Well, the only one she'll listen to is you. No, no, no. All she will listen to is her heart. And her heart can no longer stand the strain. Oh, please, Mr. Brick. Convince her to retire before it's too late. There is no way I can do it, Julie. She can't afford to anyway. What? With all the money she's made? It's all been spent looking for him. She won't give up, so she has to work to keep on the quest. But he's dead. He must be dead long ago. Everyone realizes that. 
Except Madame Danino. Matt! Forgive me. Mr. Brick. Oh, come, come. You should have been calling me Max long ago, Julie. Leave it that way, would you? All right, Max. But look, if she doesn't give up this hopeless romantic belief, I... I think she will be dead. Now, you've you just got to make her face the truth. Yes, you're right. All right, I'll try again. <gasps> this time, I really will try. Ah. She's coming to the end. Oh, how they love her. Why can't she settle for that? The only real love she's ever had. Uh -huh. You didn't know Andre Danino for husband. That was the real love. It's what she pours out on an audience since he is no longer with her. Tonight was good, wasn't it? You've never been better, Martha. Hmm. Superlative. Uh, strange. I felt he was there. I have never felt it so strongly that Andre was there. Marta, will it never be time for you to forget him? Never. There has to be a time. You cannot live in a dream world forever. Whatever world I live in, so long as I shall live, it will be a world that contains Andre and forever after. You're killing yourself, Marta. You need a rest. I can't rest. I shall never rest unless I find him. I know you don't believe he is alive. Nobody does but me. But I shall prove you all wrong in the end. <sighs> Has there been any other news? No. No. Then we will have to start all over again. You haven't time for this, Marty. Have a tour to complete and very heavy bookings for next year. Oh, there'll be some time for a rest in between. <laughs> a rest. Wasn't it wonderful that summer in England? The last one together. No, 46. We were so sure that disaster was all behind us. And the whole world was young again. Oh, why did Andre have to go home? It meant a lot to his career. And he was a patriot. Artists have no business in politics. He wasn't really political. He just wanted to play for his own people. And like all of us, with the war over, he thought that was the end of dictatorship. That we were all free. But they cancelled his visa to leave. <gasps> I should have gone with him. Oh, Marta, you couldn't. You were already carrying Stefan. I know. Andre would never have forgiven me if they got their clutches on his son. Yes, or his wife. Oh, I wasn't of any value to them then. He was the recognized artist. But he would no longer play for them. Not for their political gain. So, he was eliminated. Yes, eliminated. Not killed. You know that once I started to make my name, I was contacted and told that... If I came home, they would free him from prison. Well, they offered you no real proof he was alive. And you didn't. The decision was made. So leave the past alone, Marta. I can't. I can't, Max. I will never believe he's dead. You think they would have hesitated to kill him or starve him? It was announced that he had died in 59. There has been no word of him in nearly 20 years. I still know he is alive. <laughs> For all your protestations. I think in your heart of hearts, you too believe he is still alive. Or could be. Oh, now, how can you say I believe that? I am a woman, as well as an artist. Oh, I know many things. I know you. If you were sure in your own soul that Andre was dead, you would not have accepted being just my manager. Marta, he was my friend. I couldn't dream... Well, of course I love you. Why deny the truth? There is nothing you could hide from me, Max Breck. You lied to me, didn't you? When you said there was no news. Yes. The one we traced all the way to Canada. Yes. He may have crossed over into the States. The detective agency thinks they may have found him in Buffalo. Oh, where? 
I will go to him. Slowly, slowly, Marta, please. It's only a vague possibility. And you are due for an important concert in New York tomorrow. We could fly by way of Buffalo. Now, you know, that is not possible. The schedule is tight enough as it is. You've got to leave for New York tomorrow morning. But I, I, I will cancel the booking. Carnegie Hall? You can't. It's too late. The whole future rides on it. And this may be just another dead end. I, I won't go unless you follow it up. All right. All right. If you promise no interviews tonight, straight to bed. Uh, and fly with Judy tomorrow morning so you can rest in New York before the concert. You have my promise, if I have yours, that you will go yourself. You are the only one besides me who can tell if it is really Andre. What a godforsaken neighborhood. Uh, yes? Uh, Father Quinn? Uh, that'd be me. Who's wanting me? I left my spectacles off. You wouldn't know me. My name is Max Breck. Uh, could I uh, step in and ask you a few questions? Now, if it's about the plaster repair on the altar, all in good time, man. We're a poor parish here, and it all has to go through the diocese, you see. But you've got to know the church is good for it, and I'll not be done anymore. No, I, I, I want nothing from you, Father Quinn, except information. Ah, oh, oh, well then, step in, step in. We're very strong on information here at St. Pancras. <laughs> Uh, what instruction will you be seeking, Mr. Breck? It's about, uh, a Peter Dan. I understand he's a janitor here. Peter Dan has sought the sanctuary of this church. Now, he's a man who's suffered much and deserves to be left alone. It's like I told the other one of you nosing around here and upsetting the man. If he's committed some crime or other, let the police come fair and square. But I'll have none of you private eyes or whatever you are bothering him to death. Now he's about to find a little peace at last. Are you the police? No, no, I'm not. Uh, is Peter Dan his real name, Father? It's the name I accept him by. It wouldn't... It couldn't be... Andre Daninov, by any chance. That's what the other one asked. I'd give you the same answer. I don't know. Now, here's the door, for I mind no one's business with my own. I only want to see him for a few moments, Father. If he's not the man I'm looking for, I'll leave him alone. Please, please, Father, uh, close the door for a moment. Well... I promise you, if you just let me see Peter Dan, I'll know if he's the man I'm looking for. And if he is? I don't just want to help him close the door on his past, you see. I know how tragic that has been. I, I, I want to open the door to his future and the life and the love he deserves, and that's waiting for him. Oh. Well, now, Mr. Breck, you impress me as having Peter's interest at heart, but you still have to convince me. Come on in by the sitting room and we'll have a cup of tea, and you'll tell me why you're looking for him. If all you tell me is true, why wouldn't this Andre Dunnin off once he escaped from his illegal confinement and found his way to America? Go back to his wife. I can't answer that, Father. I don't know. You'd think at least he'd want to see the son he'd never seen. Well, that's no longer possible. Why not? Madame Daninoff became an Israeli citizen in 1967 at the age of 21. Her son, a pilot was shot down and killed in the Six-Day War. Oh, Mary in heaven, God's will is so often difficult to fathom. It is indeed. Still, still, it's not for the likes of us to question. I won't debate the point, Father. I only know that a woman I have admired for the best part of my life has suffered enough. And if there is a way to ease the end of a life, I intend to fight for her right to that relief. Ah, uh, you're... You're a good man... Mr. Breck. No, I doubt that, Father. But my motives in this, I hope, are pure. I'm sure they are. So, will you tell me where I can find Andre? Well, I mean, the man you know as Peter Dan. Uh, I'll, I'll take you to him. Now, forgive me, it is not all curiosity. Just one other thought before we go. Suppose it turns out this is your man. But he wants to be left alone and not go back to his old life. That is a bridge I've been waiting to cross as long as I can remember. Ah, I... Well, let's go across it together. Is he far from here? 
No further than the sound of yon piano. He's at his morning practice. I wouldn't dream of interrupting it. Except for something as important as this. Is this the end of a 30-year-old search? Is Max Breck about to meet his old friend face to face again? And if so, what will be the result of that meeting? Why would Andre Daninoff refuse to return to his wife? What ghost could haunt his freedom and still hold him a prisoner? Mystery Theater will return shortly with Act Two. From a shabby old house that is Father Quinn's living quarters, the older man leads Max Breck into the musty and shadowed church. The freshly painted walls of the altar stand out in bold relief against the peeling paint and patched plaster of the body of the church. The two men cross the transverse to the other side of the altar. You'll find the man I know as Peter Dan behind yon door. He, on second thought, in case he should turn out to be the man you seek, I, I don't know if I want him to know me as his, his betrayer. I mean him no harm, Father. And I truly believe you mean that, Mr. Blake. But that doesn't mean you may not bring it to him. Well, how? In what way? Whoever he may be, the man at that piano has found his peace, whoever and whatever he may have been. I think he would prefer to forget. We don't know that, Father Quinn. No, we don't. You said it was a bridge you would cross if you came to it. I did. Well, I'm backing out on joining you. Instead, I'll be saying a little prayer that it all comes out right for everyone concerned. Dan. Mr. Dan. Yes. What is it you want? Who are you? Ah. Andre. No. No, you... You are mistaken. My name is Dan. Peter Dan. Andre. It's Max. Max Breck. You know me. No. No, you, you have the wrong man. I am... I... I am not the secret police. I'm a friend. For 33 years, we have been searching for you, Martin and me. I am not the man you want. Not the man you named. Old friend, old friend. The years may have changed us, but I would know you anywhere. Just as you know me. I never saw you before in my life. Andre, it's no use. You knew me the moment you turned on that bench and jumped to your feet as if you were scared for your life. Why, Andre, why? I mean you no harm. Then go away and leave me. Now that I've found you at last? Never. What do you mean to do with me? Take you back to Marta. No. What? I cannot go back to her. Don't you see that I... I... Oh, Max. Max, you say that you are still my friend. Well, yes, of Then course. in the name of God, go. Go, leave me. Leave me alone as I am. Andre. Andre, I can't do that. Marta knows that I came here to try to find you. How? Well, she hired and paid for the detectives who tracked you down. Detectives? Why would she hire detectives to look for me? Because she loves you, and for every minute of every day of every year since your death was reported, she's never stopped believing that you were alive, never stopped searching for you. It would have been better that she believed me dead. Why do you say that? Max. Max, look at me. What is left of me? I am surprised that you recognized me. It's been a long, terrible ordeal, Andre. But you've weathered it better than I or anyone could have dreamed. Why did they announce your death? There were five of us who escaped. It was beginning of winter. 
It was so cold your breath froze on your beard. Not even a rabbit would leave his burrow. They hunted us with dogs. But in the snow our scent was hard to follow and the wind drifted it across our tracks and wiped them out. After three days they left us on the plains to die. Four of us did. I was the only one to live on. On the fifth day, a gold miner coming down from the mountains to his winter quarters found me more dead than alive. He nursed me for three weeks in his cabin till I became rational again. By that time, from my ravings, he had learned most of my story. It was my great good luck he had as little love for the party and its bureaucrats as I have. With the help of a trapper, they they smuggled me under the skins to a seaport. And from there, I managed to get by boat to Japan. It was not until nearly a year later when I reached Hong Kong and was able to hunt through back copies of the papers that I found I was supposed to be dead. Why didn't you get in touch with Marta? And let them know that I was still alive? But didn't you know that Marta pestered them so much and lined up so many prominent names and made such a racket in the UN about the circumstances of your death that she finally got them to issue a full pardon posthumously? Yes. I read that when I was in Israel. Well, why didn't you come forward then? I meant to. It's why I worked my way half across the world. To hear her play. To see her again. But you didn't. Oh, I, I heard her play. It was her first big concert in Tel Aviv. She was magnificent, a success fou. They would not let her off the stage. I remember her bowing and throwing kisses. How beautiful she was. How young. With the whole world at her feet. And I knew. I knew I did not belong in her world anymore. So I... I never saw her. Oh, you fool. All the time her heart was empty for you. For what I had been, perhaps. Not what... What I have become. A man... Bitter, solitary, old, far before his time. An accident of failure, a nothing, a non-person. Oh, that is not true. I heard you when I came in. You still play. Oh, yes, I still play. On an instrument when I can, in my head when I cannot. What does that mean? Uh, all those years in the prisons, in the camps, on, on tramp ships as a seaman, in a thousand coolie labor jobs... Max, there was one thing that kept me alive. The music. The music. I could hear every note in my head. I could see it in my mind's eye. Play it with my fingers on whatever surface I could press them against. A, a, a tough rail, a, a cell wall. And for most of the years since Stefan's death, the edge of any, any bar that did not throw me out on my ear. You know about your son, then? I... I only learned about him the month before he died. I never saw him. Oh, Max, why did... Why didn't she tell me before I left that summer? She was only thinking of you. You're the only man she ever thought of. That's why you have to come back to her. No, no, I cannot well, come back. Well, why on earth not? She's at the height of her success. She has the world at her feet. She's still in her fifties and radiantly lovely. I... I am a hundred years old in body and mind. I would drag her down. I can't. I won't do that. She should have someone young and vital. Like you, Max. In the name of heaven, have some compassion, man. Leave me alone. I may have nothing else, but I have a kind of peace here. Go, tell her you found out that I was shot trying to escape. Marry her yourself. She doesn't want me. She wants you. If she had me, she might as well have a ghost. I cannot do it. You must. You have to. What do you mean, I have to? Whatever you are is what Marta wants. She's dying, Andre. What? What? What do you mean, she's dying, Max? No one knows just how ill she is except me. Not even a secretary worries about her overworking. Not even Marta herself. But if she rests, if she takes it easy... She'll never do that as long as you are missing. And to pay for the detectives that scour the world looking for you, she has to work harder and harder. It's a treadmill that's killing her. Oh, Max. Max, how long has she got? A month, a year. Well, not many more. Who knows? 
If she has the most important thing in the world she really wants. But, but it's foolish. It is romantic nonsense. Life is not young love. It is hard and bitter and, and unfair. And we cannot turn back the years. It would take a miracle to make it even a faded memory of what it was. But you know as well as I do, Andre, you've got to try. Well, you have not left me much choice. All right. I will try. But I still say it is a mistake. I, uh... Well, I, I, I haven't any money. Oh, that's the least of our problems. Go pack whatever you have to take with you while I make some plane reservations. Uh, it won't take long. I, I've learned to travel light. Oh, Max. I thought you'd never get here. I'm sorry, Jody. Plane was late. Uh, how's Martha? Oh, a nervous wreck. I, I've never seen her like this. Well, where's... Andre... Uh... He stopped to comb his hair or fix his handkerchief or something. He's a nervous wreck, too. Oh, we all are. You know, the house is almost in. We can't hold the curtain too much longer. I understand. Oh, well, maybe it would have been better if you'd let them talk on the phone before you flew in. Oh, don't blame me. Andre didn't want to, neither did Marta. I think it's better that they meet again first, face to face. Max? Yes? Uh, what's he, uh, what's he like? I, I mean, what does he look like? Like someone who's lived 30 years in hell. It's bitten deep into his face. It pulls his shoulders down. But the worst part of all is what haunts his eyes. Oh, how terrible. I, I don't know what Martha expects. I'd better go prepare her. I think you'd better. Even at best, I'm not sure she's going to be able to play the recital tonight. And now go right in before... Uh-uh. It's too late. Here he comes. That... Bent, wizened old man? That wizened old man was once tall and straight and young and bristling with talent. That's how she still pictures him. Andre, this way. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, oh, Max. That's all right. But we have to hurry. It's almost curtain time. Well, then perhaps we'd better wait until... No, 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 no. Marta's waiting anxiously. Oh, this is Julie Rand, Marta's secretary. Yeah, how do you do? Mr. Deninov. What? Oh, yes, of course, that's who I am. Uh, here we are, Marta's dressing room. Marta, it's Max. Come in, Max. Andre, let me go in first. I thought you would never get here. Uh, where? He's is... here, Marta. He's right here, but uh, the house is waiting. Are you sure you want to see him before the recital? After 33 years, how much longer do you think I can wait? Of course, my dear. Come in, Andre. I'll leave you alone. Um, Andre? Martha? Across the gap of perhaps three feet, close enough to touch, they face each other, a frail and indomitable woman, a man bent and twisted, old before his time. Three feet, did I say? Or is that gap wider than a lifetime? Too far to bridge and lead them back to each other again. Mystery Theater will continue shortly with Act Three. There are some moments in all our lives when time stands still. The first kiss whose magic you are afraid to break. The terrible news of some loved one's death. A moment of victory in a game or the terror of some nightmare from which you could not awake. The joy of something you have long anticipated turning out to be everything you imagined, or the sick feeling in the pit of your stomach when you found it nothing but disappointment. This is such a moment for Marta and Andre. Andre. Marta. I... I've 
been waiting so long. You... You're just as beautiful as ever. And you... as handsome. Oh, no. No, that is not true. In my eyes, you are. You must be seeing me as I was then. I always see you as you were then. I always will. But, Marta, these lines, these wrinkles, my hair... Andre, what do you think I would be without my makeup? My hair rinse. I'm not a young girl anymore. Outside. But inside, I feel the same as the 23-year-old who kissed you goodbye. And seeing you again, all I see is the boy. I never dreamed I was going to lose. Oh, Martha, darling. It's all right. It's all right, Andre. I'm all right. Just hold me. No, it, it, it's been so long. So long. Too long. It's too late. I'll be no good for you. Oh, don't, don't say that, Andre. I need you now more than ever. I only want one promise from you. What? That you will never leave me again. It has been such a long fight. I'm so tired. I need your strength. There is not much left. They battered most of it out of me, and the last years since I escaped have drained what was left. I may not show it, Andre, but inside there's almost nothing of me left. I need you to lean on. It is your inner strength I need. Marta, the house is getting restless. Oh, give me just a moment longer, Max. You had better go, Marta. Not until I know I will find you here when I get back. I will be here. And you will stay. I will stay. Till death do us part. No. What? I have gone through enough. We have gone through enough in this life ever to be parted again. If death should take you first, I would follow right on your heels. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. What? <laughs> Nothing. Just Elizabeth Barrett Browning's sonnet to her husband about how she loved him. Oh, Andre. Andre. Don't let anyone or anything take this away from us again. As heaven is my witness, I never will. I love you, Marta. I love you, Andre. I'm sorry, Marta. I'm but... coming, Max. Kiss me, darling. Marta. Oh, I am in heaven. This must be heaven. Oh, what a recital I shall give them tonight. Oh, my darling, I can't write you a love poem like Elizabeth Browning, but I can play you one. Will you be out front? Oh, yes, with Max. Then listen carefully. You will recognize my love song when I play it. We uh, can't keep them waiting any longer. Are you all right, Marta? Oh, I never felt more glorious in my life. Every note is for you, Andre. And especially in that one song. To our future, darling. Au revoir. Well, Andre, it looks as though congratulations are in order. A marriage has been rearranged. Yes. It is a miracle. If it lasts. Oh, come, what do you mean? I don't know. Just some premonition I cannot shake. You'll notice that this time, it was Martha who said goodbye. Why is she playing this? It's not on the program. It is a message to me. Message? Yes, in place of a sonnet. What? A love song. Just for me, you see. I... Marta! She's fainted! No. No, she has not fainted. She... She is dead. Julie, shut the door quickly. 
It's a madhouse here. Aren't they ever going to let up? Oh, eventually, I suppose. Well, why can't they let us alone? Julie, it's a great story. To be practical, the press and the media have every right to follow it up. You should hear some of the book offers, movie bids, heaven knows what else they've been bombarding my office with. All right, forget that for now. How is Andre today? Oh, no change. Still in his room? Oh, he hasn't come out of it since the funeral. Is he eating? Not really. Is he getting any sleep? I don't think so. Whenever I look in, he's just lying on his back, staring at the ceiling with his eyes so vacant. I... <laughs> Sometimes he's so still, I think maybe he's... What does the doctor say? If he doesn't snap out of it, he'll have to be hospitalized. At least there they can feed him intravenously. Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. I'll go in and have a look at him. Hello, Andre. Andre, it's Max. Aren't you going to say hello? No. I'm better at saying goodbye. Oh, now come. You've got to snap out of this. By all means. I wish I knew the way to do it. Well, you won't get anywhere just by lying there. Max, do you know what I've been doing? I have been lying here, willing myself to die. I want to die, but I cannot make myself. All those years of hanging on, building, increasing my will to live just to spite those... Yeah, maybe they have the last laugh after all. Now that I want to die, the will to live is too strong to allow me to... Andre, listen to me. Suicide. Yes, that would be a way, you see. Only my religion does not allow that. So it appears I have to go on living, separated from Marta again. You've got to do something to help him, Max. I know that, Julie, but what? I don't know. <sighs> If he just had some other interest to throw himself into, like Madame had after Stefan was killed. <laughs> she hadn't had her piano and her music. She'd have been... Uh, uh, uh. Oh, what is it, Max? Music. Music, of course. That might be it. Oh, wh where are you going? To see Charles Abelman at World Broadcasting. I think maybe he can make an offer that Andre just can't refuse. I have your word on this, Charlie? Absolutely. No hoopla, no exploitation. Just the facts simply and decently told in good taste. I have your word. Max, you don't need my word. This network is rebuilding its image. One of the programs we count on to do that is one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, I know. I've seen it, and I admire it oh, very thank much. Thank you. We don't want anything to change that picture for our audience. So you can count on that. All right. I think I can persuade Andre to do it. And you will allow him to play. At least 15 minutes. That's the deal. There has to be enough exposure so I can start building a career for him again. Fifteen minutes, that's a long time. Is, uh... Is he good enough? Can he still play? Oh, yes, I've heard him. Well, I, I think I ought to hear him first myself, Max, before I okay that. All right, I'll see what I can work out. But first, I have to sell the whole idea to Andre. I'll get back to you. Charles Abelman. Charlie, Max Brick. We're on for your show this week. Oh, that's great, Max. But uh, what about your promise I can hear, Mr. Danino? I've worked that out. You'll want to pick his own piano for the broadcast. So can you meet us at Steinman's tomorrow at 12 noon? It's right across from Connie Hall. While he's trying out the pianos, I'll get him to play something for you. I promise you, you won't make the trip for nothing. <laughs> I don't know just why I am doing this, Max. You know why, Andre. You've got to have something to take your mind off what, what has happened. What a better thing to do than to go back to your piano. Carry on. For Marta. Now, you've got to make a living somehow. And you, you really think that I can make it play again? After what I heard in the church that first day, yes. All those years of dry playing on stone walls, on steel tables, the edge of my cot... Hearing the music only in my mind, all that kept me from going mad. It kept me alive. Was this what it was for? Or well, why not decide that it was? Oh, Max, I can't decide anything for myself. That's what I meant by I don't know why I am doing this. It is something inside me or outside and beyond me that is urging me to do it. What do you mean by that? I, I don't know. 
I told you once it would take a miracle to bring back the past. Maybe now I'm looking for one to bring me the future. I've never seen so many concert pianos in my life. Charlie, this is only one room. There are four others. Oh, no. He could be here all day. He tried every piano in this room, and they didn't suit him. Now, don't tell me you'll go through all the others. Uh, yes, Julie, what is it? He's found one he likes. Where is he? In the back room. Oh, he's playing something. Come on, Charlie, if you want to hear this. And, oh, just a minute, Mr. Brack. What is it, Julie? Well, he, uh, he said he wanted to be alone for a minute. Well, we don't have to show ourselves. Well, maybe we should get back to him. He was, uh, well, uh, strange. Strange how? Well, he smiled at me, and he, he looked sort of happy. And he said, do you believe in miracles, Julie? And when I didn't know what to answer, he said, I think I'm just about to. I don't know what that means. Hey, hold it a minute. By George. <laughs> Good enough for you, Charlie? Oh, that's magnificent. No. No, stop him. No, please don't. I want to hear more. Oh, we shouldn't interrupt it, You Julie. must. Don't you hear what he's playing? It's what Madame was playing oh, when now, she... Julie, 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 take it easy. What's the matter I don't you? know. I don't know. It's just... Don't let him stop him before he gets to that same phrase where... Oh, oh, oh no. What happened? Oh, no. I don't know. Come on. He, he's on the floor. Just like me. Take care of it, Charlie. Is, is he... Andre. Is he... Andre. Andre, you, you all right? Oh, oh yes. Yes. What happened? I... I suddenly found out how to pray. For me, it... it is with music. So I asked God to... to bring me to Marta. And he... he turned his face on me again and worked... worked a miracle to bring me home. To my... My wife. Is... Is he dead? Yeah. What happened? Heart attack, debility, who knows. I'm not a doctor. Well, maybe God just called him home. What did he mean about a, a miracle? I think that he got what he wanted. Max? Yes, Julie? This... Piano he picked out. Yes, yes, yes. What about it? Well, look at the serial number. Why? This is the piano Madame de Ninoff was playing at the concert when she died. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. Max brought the bodies of Marta and Andre back to Israel, where they were buried beside their son's hero's grave. The stone above the grave reads, In memory of Marta and Andre Daninov, I shall but love thee better after death. That Max picked that quote was sheer coincidence. Or was it maybe just another minor miracle? Our cast included Norman Rose, Ralph Bell, Evie Juster, and Ian Martin. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dream Come in Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. When you strike at a serpent that hisses, you may only cause it to spring. That's rather sage advice when you come to consider it. 
But why is it so often disregarded? Why do people poke at snakes? Why don't people let sleeping dogs lie? Perhaps it's just as well, after all. If everyone always did the sensible thing, whatever would we do for story? Miss Constant, didn't you say in front of many witnesses that you were going to kill Mr. Crawford? Well, sometimes you say something that you... Weren't you you in his apartment at approximately the time of the murder? Well, I only went there to... And aren't your fingerprints on the knife that killed him? But there must be an explanation. There is. You're guilty of murder. Our mystery drama, Everybody Does It, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Robert Dryden. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We're in one of those posh eating places where mediocre food is called by esoteric French names and customers pay exorbitant, even obscene prices to be treated like cattle by an arrogant, ill-mannered staff. And yet, they fight to get in. Why? Well, you know why. To rub shoulders with, or at least stare at, the celebrities. And who is here tonight? Well, at one table, we have the voluptuous, lovely, yet aging star... Margaret Constant. Nearby, Wilson Crawford, the illustrious critic. Wilson, aren't you going to say hello to Margaret? Perry, I'm no longer required to say hello to Margaret. But you should say hello to Margaret. Ah, and why? To prove that you're civilized. (laughs) What are you doing? Uh, what, what, What am I doing? Wilson, you take me to dine at a place like this and I see you... Actually stealing packets of sugar? Oh, well, uh, 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 stop laughing. Can't help it. Perhaps the whole thing is my subconscious reaction or my adjustment to a new austerity. Oh, well, had I known you were strapped, I uh, would have suggested a more modest place. Yes, well, Perry, I asked you to dinner because I must have a serious talk with you. Oh, certainly. Uh, But first, you know, I think you should say hello to Margaret. I don't think so. For old time's sake? For old time's sake, for new time's sake, for all time's sake, I divorced the woman and that's an end to it. Nothing could persuade me to talk to Margaret. Well, I happen to know something that just might. Give it up, Perry. Margaret has signed to do a new play. That's no longer a personal concern. It's called St. Joan of Arc. I find it awkward to... St. Joan? Who's going to play St. Joan? Well, who are we talking about? Margaret. Oh, no, I won't permit it. A new drama. Joan of Arc? Yes, she goes into rehearsal next week. Well, we'll see about that. Excuse me. I will say hello to Margaret. Where do you come off playing Joan of Arc? Oh, good evening, Wilson. I won't have it. Won't you sit down? Oh, but just for a moment. I'm expecting someone important. What is this Joan of Arc nonsense? How have you been, Wilson? Have you lost your senses? I've regained them completely. The proof? I divorced you. You are going to play Joan of Arc? You're 50. 43. 54. I was being kind. You're going to play Joan of Arc with that voluptuous figure, those smoldering eyes, that voice? You're going to play Joan of Arc? No, this is going to be a Freudian interpretation. Oh, Margaret, who has overwhelmed your senses, seduced you with this delusion? Only the finest director in the world, Kavalevsky. Kava... (laughs) What, that charlatan? That genius. You hate him because you cannot intimidate him. A Freudian version of Joan of Arc. Margaret... Do not appear in this play. Run along, darling. It's garbage. It's self-indulgent trash. I'll tear it apart. Oh, reviewing it already. You haven't even seen it. I'll destroy it. We shall see. This will be Peter's masterwork and my greatest role. And everyone will acclaim it. Everyone 
But you... Joan of Arc, I suggest you open it in a burlesque house. Well, have you simmered down sufficiently? A woman's an absolute fool. So? What's to be done? Ah... Uh, I have my own problems. Uh, Perry, would you pull over to the curb? I have to talk with you. I've been trying to broach the subject all night. Uh, what subject? Money. Money? I never worried about money. There was always enough and to spare. I made it or Margaret made it. When we decided to part, I let her have everything. Oh, well, I thought you had a better lawyer than that. She's going to need it. She'll go broke trying to prove she's a serious actress. Well, now, I seem to be a bit short, and I was wondering if you could give me an advance. I thought I'd do a book of critical essays. Uh, I don't publish critical essays. They don't make any money. Now, a blockbuster bestseller with all the dirt and the inside theater gossip of the past 20 years? Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> We've had this discussion before. I couldn't write such a book. Well, thanks anyhow, Perry. I'll just have to scale down my style of living or work a little harder. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> would, uh, would you be interested in a rather uh, lucrative special income? Oh, uh -huh, would I? You're, I, I can trust you, Wilson. And there's no reason why you shouldn't make some easy money. Easy money? Mm hmm I'm afraid that has an ominous sound. Oh, but it's really very simple. What would I have to do? Well, people like you and me, we travel constantly. Yes. And you're always flying to London to see the new plays. And I scour the continent for literary properties. Thus, we may perform a service for, uh certain people. What sort of service? A messenger service. The more I hear this, the less I like. Well, we are uh, eminently reputable people. Uh, who would suspect us of anything or even think to watch us? Well, you... You're about to suggest some smuggling. Uh, uh, now, just consider that you're acting the part of a uh, confidential courier. Yeah, of course, it's dishonest. Well, of course. <laughs> but everybody does it. Everyone? Uh, you'd be surprised how many. People whose credentials are impeccable. But those people are thieves. Perhaps. But only a little bit. One cannot be a little bit of a thief. You are. Me? Yes. Don't you steal packets of sugar from restaurant tables? Oh, well, that... That isn't stealing. <sighs> Well, I suppose it's, it's all in the way you look at it. Well, how can you compare? Ah, uh, you mind dropping me off at my place? Hmm. Well, I tried. Well, thank you, Perry, but I don't think I'd be interested. Ah, Mr. Crawford. Oh, uh, yes. What is it, Sefkins? Uh, shall you be having lunch at home, sir? Oh, I suppose so. Oh, Sefkins, I brought some sugar home last night. Yes, I'm aware of that. I emptied your jacket pockets this morning. Are you laughing at me? No, oh, no, sir. No, sir. We have to tighten our belts. Any economy, no matter how small, is important. Uh, yes, sir. And if we're not required to purchase sugar over the course of a year, isn't that an important saving? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just pardon me, sir. Uh, Mr. Crawford's residence. Yes, who's calling? Oh. Yes, I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Crawford is out. Yes, I shall give him your message. Who was that? Uh, the bank, sir. The account seems to be overdrawn. Well, that must be a mistake. Oh, I'm afraid not. Call back and say I'll deposit some money today. Well, unfortunately, sir, I cannot do that. There are no funds, Mr. Crawford. Anywhere. Well, I expect my salary from the magazine. Yes, but that will just cover the rent. And then those articles I wrote for the... Yes, sir, but that check is not due until the 15th of next month. 
Huh. Well, obviously, we must do something, Sepkins. Uh, yes, sir. Any mail this morning? All bills. Any calls? Uh, Mr. Gulliver called, sir. Perry, what do you want? He just called to chat. I said you were busy writing. Yes, yes, that's exactly what you should have told him. Mm. That's all, sir. And it's just as well. We've had enough bad news for one day. Uh, yes, sir. Ah, uh, well, when one must, one must... No. But, on the other hand... Come on in, Wilson. Perry, I'll be brief. This, uh... This thing you discussed with me... I've decided to try it. Well, I knew you would. Just exactly... What is involved? Well, the next time you go to London, see, I know somebody who will pay your fare and give you a thousand dollars. In return for what? You carry a small package. Which contains? Usually. Gems. And then what? (laughs) Well, then someone will relieve you of your burden. And when you're ready to return, there'll be another package. And another fee. Well, what do you think? I think it's wrong. Uh, True, true. But I uh, plan to go to London next week. Leave everything to me. Are you at home to Miss Crawford, sir? Oh, of course he's at home, Sefkins. Uh, Miss Crawford, sir. Thank you, Sefkins. That'll be all. Margaret, you shouldn't do that to poor Sefkins. You know how seriously he takes his job. I don't have much time to waste. Ah, yes, indeed. And yet, isn't time the image of eternity? Oh, stop it. You always have to remind people how learned you are. That's why I divorced you. Well, if memory serves, I divorced you. We decided to part friends. We did have 15 years... And I admit I do have a a residue of affection for you. We're still concerned with each other. Are we? For instance, the other night, you sought to warn me. You felt that I'm about to take a disastrous step. You were compelled to dissuade me. And so I have come here to dissuade you. From what? From whatever you propose to do with Perry Gulliver. I don't propose to do anything with Perry Gulliver. That's not true. Every time the two of you put your heads together, it's the beginning of a catastrophe. You never liked Perry. Perry Gulliver is a scoundrel. Why? Because he uses people. He's a thief. He may have lost other people's money on occasion. Including yours. Well, those were the breaks, the risks and chances you take. Perry Gulliver is a thief in his heart. Just exactly... What have you come here to tell me? I feel I should warn you. Keep away from Perry. (laughs) You're always jealous of him. As a matter of fact, you resented all of my friends. Out of the goodness of my heart, I come up here to do you a good turn. And what do I receive? Scorn and abuse. All right. I wash my hands of the entire business. She thinks she has. Little does Margaret know that soon she shall be immersed in this business up to her neck, if not higher. Wilson Crawford, Margaret Constant, and Perry Gulliver, a trio. But they shall soon become a duo in Act Two. And may we expect a solo in Act Three? Patience, friends. We're getting there. The commandments are uncompromising. They state in bold and fiery letters, Thou shalt not. However, we perfect mortals try to shade the meaning here and there. We console ourselves by saying, Doesn't everybody do it? Well, whether or not everybody does or doesn't, 
a gentleman named Wilson Crawford is about to. Now get that, Sefkins. Don't bother. Hello. Wilson? Oh, it's you, Perry. Well, weren't you expecting my call? Yes, I suppose I was. Well, I'll drive you to the airport. Uh, can you be downstairs in ten minutes? Yes, I suppose so. Good, I have your ticket and uh, a package. A rather small one. It should fit into your attache case. Perry, I don't know... Don't what... be so nervous. The thing is absolutely ironclad, surefire, and foolproof. <laughs> You have your ticket and the packet. What's in it? Uh, that's really not your affair. Well, it'll be very much my affair if I'm caught. But you shall not be caught. How can you be sure? Because you're you, Wilson Crawford, the eminent critic. Your reputation protects you. Uh, yes, yes, my reputation. And I'm selling it uh, for a handsome fee. As Samuel Johnson said... Madam, we have already established what you are. We're merely haggling over the price. Uh, Wilson, uh, let us not go into an essay on morality. What am I carrying? Leave it in your luggage. It'll be picked up in your hotel room. But what am I carrying? And you'll find another packet in its place. Perry, answer the question. And also an envelope with your money. Perry? In crisp new bills. I won't get on that plane until you tell me. Diamonds. Now, are you happy? No, I'm not happy. It's just... If it had been something else... I would have refused. You take what you get, Wilson. And once you're really in this thing... You never even think about it. And so... I say to you, my accusers, it is you who stand accused. I shall die at the stake, but a purer flame already shines in my heart. Am I saying that right? If anyone anywhere could ever give that line a more transcendent meaning, my name is not Kavalevsky. What bothers me is how can a flame shine in one's heart? I mean, shouldn't it burn? How quickly we jump to the obvious interpretation. It's just the kind of line that Wilson would tear me to pieces for in his review. Wilson, Wilson, I see, my darling, you are still not free from him yet. Well, I'm just asking. Trust me. It is not the literal word that matters. It is the tension in the voice. Oh. Besides, besides, I believe your Mr. Wilson is at present in the United Kingdom. He'll be here for opening night if he has to swim all the way. That's what I'm afraid of. Courage, my darling. You are no longer the trilby to his Svengali. Now, now let us reach for true greatness. <laughs> Wilson, you're back. Well, why didn't you call me? It skipped my mind, Perry. You were to call me as soon as you arrived home. I know, but this is an opening night. Uh, you, uh, you have something to deliver to me? Oh, yes, I suppose I have. You suppose? Yes, an envelope. A very large cellophane envelope. It appeared to contain several pounds of... Well, it looked like sugar... You had no business opening it. No one would pay to smuggle a few pounds of sugar, so I must assume it was a drug. Hand it over. I draw the line at that. So it's just as well. But, well, what, what is just as well? It's just as well that I lost it. You what? I must have lost it. I don't have it. Just hold it, hold it for a minute. Therefore, since I cannot deliver the goods, I cannot accept the money. Here it is. Same crisp bills, $1,000. Furthermore, Perry, I've decided this isn't for me. Wilson. Wilson, you had better give me that package. This is morally wrong. How can I do it? Margaret was right about you. Margaret? What does Margaret have to do with it? She smelled a rat long before I did. All she had to do was see us sitting together in that restaurant, and she knew there was trouble. Listen to me. She's right. You are a thief. Well, be one without me. I quit. 
You can't quit. Watch me. They won't let you quit. They? Wilson, I am responsible for you. Because I brought you into it, I'll be held accountable. I'll go to the police. Do you know what you're talking about? I must be on my way. I have a play to review. Uh, well, an alleged play. You must give me that package. I told you, I don't have it. What happened to it? I don't know. It's just gone, that's all. It was placed inside your suitcase when you left London. And yet when I looked for it this morning, it wasn't there. Well, what could have happened to it? I haven't the vaguest idea. They won't believe it. They'll think you sold it on your own. The, the street value of that package is well over a million dollars. Indeed. Well, I can't miss the opening curtain. Wilson. Wilson, don't, don't, don't force me to... To what? To do something drastic. I am responsible for you. You should be. And I'm responsible for you, too. After all, a man should always be his brother's keeper. Hello? This is Marigold. Uh, this is Perry. Uh, Perry Gulliver. Yes, Mr. Gulliver? I, uh, I think we have a problem. A problem? It's Wilson Crawford. Wants to quit. You must convince him... That it's impossible. But that's only a half of it. Yes? He doesn't have the package. The package? The one he was to bring from London. He doesn't have it. He claims it's lost. He can't find it. Yes? Uh, that's why I say we have a problem. We have no problem, Mr. Gulliver. You have a problem. Uh, but I... You I brought him into the activity. You are responsible. But uh, what is there I can do? Whatever is required to obtain the package. But how can I do that? You had better learn. And quickly. It's your responsibility. Margaret, Margaret, darling, you were wonderful. Thank you. An entire new career is before you. I showed him, didn't I? You were incandescent. Oh, listen, it is 11.20 yet. Wilson's review is coming on in a moment. Must we listen to that fool? Oh, I want to hear him eat his words. Turn it on for me. Must you listen to that spiteful, bitter, Please stupid... Please turn it on. Good evening. This is Wilson Crawford. I said to my producer, how can a news segment do justice to a play in the three minutes this permits me? Well, for Joan of Arc, a new drama written and directed by Alexander Kavalevsky, one requires not just three minutes, but three hours, three days. How does one even begin to explore the torturous reasoning, or lack of it, which prompted so many people to associate themselves with this pathetic hopeless excursion into banality and futility. How dare you, Wilson! And Margaret Constant as Joan of Arc. She is punished for her hubris. For the first time on stage, she looks her age. Oh! I, I'd kill him! The ludicrous spectacle of this aging woman of the world oh. desperately trying to convince us that she is the chaste spiritual teenage girl who is filled with the rapture of heavenly voices. Turn it off! He does not deserve to live. I'll kill him with my own hands. Uh, Mr. Crawford. As what is it, Sefkins? Uh, the doorman telephones, sir. Uh, Miss Constant is uh, <clears throat> on the way up. Ah, oh, we'd better lock the door until she cools off a bit. I'm afraid that might not be possible, sir. Uh, she may still have her key. I'm afraid she does. Wilson? Wilson Crawford? Looking for me, Margaret? I'm going to kill you, Wilson. Why? You destroyed me tonight. I would suppose you destroyed yourself. You won't get away with it. You can't deny you were wrong. You heard what I said. I am going to kill you. Go ahead. Kill me or don't kill me, but let's not play another bad scene. You don't believe me. Did you bring along a gun, a knife? Poison? 
How's it going to be? Uh, uh, Miss Crawford, you're quite upset. And if you'll pardon my Sefkin, saying... Sefkin, she can't kill me. She didn't come prepared. I could kill you with this. Uh, uh, now, Miss Constance... I bought you this jeweled letter opener. Uh, Miss Crawford, please, uh, put that thing down. Let her play the scene, Sefkin. Uh, you think this is a joke? It's bad theater. And we must not subject poor Sefkins to a mediocre performance. Sefkins, uh, why don't you go to bed? Is it but, sir, I think we should Thank all... Thank you, us... Sefkins. Good night. Uh, 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 good night, sir. Uh, good night, Miss Constance. And now, dear Margaret, where were we? I'm going to kill you, not only because of your review tonight, but because of your arrogance. Poor, poor Margaret. You don't believe me. Margaret. Oh, Margaret. Oh, stop that. Let go of that letter opener. I'm going to kill you. Let go, Margaret. No, you, you're hurting my arm. Drop it. I, I hate you. I hate you. I'm sorry, Margaret. But I had to write that review. Oh, you, you destroyed me. I destroyed a false and ludicrous woman you were trying to be. It was necessary surgery. Who asked you? No one had to ask me. Now you can go back to the Margaret Constant who is true to herself. I never want to see you again as long as I live. What? Who's that? Oh, what time is it? It's morning. All right, all right, just a minute. Let me put on a robe. Oh, who are you? Why are you ringing my bell? And why did the elevator man let you come up? Miss Margaret Constant. And if I am? If you are, I have to talk to you. About what? A murder. A murder? I'm Lieutenant Taplick on the Homicide Division. Uh, and you you wake me up at this ungodly hour of the morning. Don't you people ever sleep? I'm sorry, Miss Constant. Well, why do you come to me? I, I can't help you. I don't know anything about murder. I don't even know anyone who ever was murdered. Unfortunately, Miss Constant, you do. Or you did know someone who has just been murdered. Do I? Who? Mr. Crawford. Mr. Wilson Crawford. You've heard them shout at ball games, kill the umpire. And many people in the theater harbor the same feelings about critics. If this homicide lieutenant is to be believed, someone has just murdered our friend Wilson Crawford. No wonder the police have made a beeline for Margaret Constant's apartment. After all, she made no secret of her feelings about Crawford. She's in for some rough sledding in Act Three. Preserve, said the Roman philosopher, at all times, a temperate and pacific posture towards the world. Thus, you shall be spared the storms that constantly buffer the headstrong, the turbulent, and the unruly. Excellent counsel. A wise man does not broadcast any feelings of violence he may harbor against another. Look at what's happened to poor Margaret Constant. She kept raging about how she was going to kill Wilson Crawford. So naturally, when Wilson is murdered, the police do not have far to go. Wilson? Wilson is dead? Yes, Miss Constant. Oh, it's, it's impossible. I was with him last night. For how long? Well, it was uh, five minutes, more or less. I, I, At what time? What time? Well, let's see. I, I heard the broadcast. It was 11.20. I took a, a taxi to the apartment. It was 11.45 about. The approximate time of the murder. Who would want to kill Wilson? I am also saying that you were there at about the time of the murder. What? Finally, I'm saying that I should read you your rights as a citizen, and then I must ask you to come downtown. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Sefkins. Did you hear Miss Constant threaten to kill Mr. Crawford? Uh, unfortunately. And how did she say she would do it? Uh, with your permission, sir. They, uh, they were both highly volatile people. She was furious. And they uh, played a scene, as uh, they so often did. I suppose they enjoyed the drama. Uh, that's what it was, a scene? Uh, yes, sir, that's what I thought it was. I'd had uh, 15 years of it <laughs> during their marriage. Indeed, that's why I left the room and went to bed. And she picked up the letter opener from the desk and said, I'll kill you with this. Uh, yes, uh, yes, sir. And you then left the room? Uh, yes, sir. I didn't think that she and was... And about uh, 7 a.m., you came into the room, found Mr. Crawford dead on the floor. Uh, yes, sir. He had been stabbed in the back. And the letter opener was lying there next to him. Uh, uh, permit me, sir, if I may. They were both angry at themselves. You see... They had no business being divorced. They cared for each other very much. That isn't true, Sefkins. Uh, this, it was all um, a misunderstanding. Uh, she was furious. But he incited her, and I think it was their way of, of making love. How dare you, Sefkins? See, they, they played one of their usual violent scenes. Oh. Uh, but this time it just got out of hand, that's all. Well, that isn't true. Uh, she didn't mean to kill him, Lieutenant. She... I didn't. Kill him, I didn't. Thank you very much, Mr. Sefkins. Yeah. That'll be all. All right, Miss Constant. You ready to make a statement? Yes, the same one I've been making all along. I didn't do it. You had the motive. You made the threat. You were there at the approximate time of the killing. Your fingerprints are on a murder weapon. Lieutenant, I was furious. I did say, I'll kill you. I did go to the apartment. I did pick up the letter opener. But after Sefkins left the room, I, I, I even fought with him. But, but only for a moment. And then I threw the letter opener on the floor and, and I went home. And that's what I intend to tell the jury. And you expect them to believe it? Yes. Because it's true. No, Miss Constance. I didn't not... kill him, and you know it. I loved him. <laughs> I'm a fool, but I'm not a murderer. I know who killed Wilson. Perry Gulliver. Where does he come into this? Where's your proof? How can you accuse someone of murder without proof? You accused me. And what did you have? A few flimsy pieces of circumstantial evidence? Ah, well, what do you got? Wilson spent all of last week in London. Why? What does that have to do with anything? When Wilson goes to London, it's on business. All right. So he had business. What business? The only reason his magazine would send him would be to review the new plays there. It's the end of the season. There aren't any. So why did he go? Well, maybe it was a pleasure trip. No, he couldn't afford it. He was broke. Well, all right. I still don't One see what... One why... night... I see Wilson and Perry very chummy in a restaurant. A few days later, Wilson flies to London. A week later, he returns. On the next day, he's murdered. Obviously, Perry sent Wilson to London. Why? Why? What was Wilson supposed to be doing in London? He didn't write anything. How do you know? I have friends in London. They kept an eye on him for me. Went to a few parties and came home. All right, so where are we? If Wilson didn't go there to do anything, perhaps he went there to get something. What? How do I know what? You're the professional. Don't you have any ideas? I've opened a world of infinite possibilities. Now, if this were a play... Yeah, well, Miss Constant, this is not the theater. Well, you see, we have Perry Gulliver sending Wilson to London for something. But what? Drugs, diamonds, military secrets. Don't you ever go to the movies? When Wilson returned, they, um, they, they quarreled about it. Well, how do we know? How do we know? That's something we can prove. Maybe. Uh, sir, how may I be of service, Lieutenant? Let me ask him. Well, go ahead. It's your investigation. When Mr. Crawford returned from London, did Perry Gulliver visit him? Uh, yes. See, Lieutenant? 
Do you know why, Sifkins? Well, uh, Mr. Gulliver seems somewhat upset. Why? Uh, uh, Miss Constant, I never eavesdrop. You know that. Uh, why do you say Mr. Gulliver seems upset? Yes, well, uh, Lieutenant, <coughs> as Mr. Gulliver was leaving, I gathered he was angry because Mr. Crawford was supposed to have brought something from London I for him. I told you. All right, all right, all right. When Mr. Crawford came home from the airport, did he have his luggage? Uh, yes, sir, his suitcase. Uh, did you unpack it as usual? Uh, yes, yes, yes. First, I ran Mr. Crawford's tub, and, uh, and as he was bathing, I put away his things. Did you notice anything unusual in the suitcase? Unusual? There's no, sir. Nothing at all? Thanks, Hopkins. Well, you might call it unusual, but I'd, I'd already become used to it. Used to what? The sugar. Sugar? Uh, uh, Miss Constant, after you left him, Mr. Crawford developed the oddest habits. He collected sugar. That is, while dining out, he would, well... Loot the sugar containers, uh, uh, take packets of it, and, and bring them home to me. And he had sugar in his suitcase. Uh, well, uh, sir, I noticed some of it had spilled. Uh, it was in a sort of package. I opened it, and uh, there was a rather a large amount. Sugar? Yes, uh, as I said to myself, now this is too much. Packets are one thing, but loose sugar. <laughs> now this has got to stop. Besides... I didn't like the looks of it. The looks? Yes, 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 yes. It was, uh, it was kind of powdery, so I poured it down the drain. You poured it down the drain? Uh, yes, Miss Constant. Lieutenant, it was a drug. Heroin, cocaine, whichever one of them looks like sugar. Yeah, but we have no proof. We can get it. How? I'll call Perry. Tell him to meet me at my place. I'll say I have the stuff. And I'll deal with him, see? See what? I'll get him to admit that he killed Wilson. You can be in the bedroom. At the, uh, the moment juste, you step out and you put the cuffs on him. Well, it works okay in those cop shows, but I can't do it. Why not? It's entrapment. It's against the law. I intend to accuse Perry of murder. I intend to tell him why he killed Wilson. He may try to kill me, and uh, I could use some protection. Yeah, but Miss Constant, what'll we do if it was only sugar? I'll call him right now. Not from police headquarters. Well, what an amusing story, Margaret, dear. I knew the two of you couldn't be up to any good. So I confronted Wilson. I got it out of him. I could get anything out of him. Yes, except a good review. Which is why you killed him. I didn't. You did. Well, evidently, the uh, police are satisfied with you. Are you satisfied with me, Perry? How about your conscience? Oh, oh, dear Margaret, I was born without one. How about your safety? You were handling those drugs for someone. There weren't an accounting. Suppose I were to tell you, I know where the drugs are. You? What? Ah. <laughs> Wilson came home. He told me everything. I convinced him to give me the drugs for, uh, for safekeeping. Do you want to hear more? <laughs> Go on. Quite frankly, the idea was to hold you up. But you came back last night, right after I left. You got into a fight with Wilson. You killed him. Where did it get you? I... Have the drugs. <laughs> what drugs? I need money, Perry. I didn't kill him. But they've got circumstantial evidence. I'll need the best lawyer in the country. I'll make a deal for the drugs. But I don't know how to go about it. Now, you go back to your people. You tell them. I'll be reasonable. I only want enough for the... the best lawyer. That's all. How, uh... How do I know you've got the drugs? Show me. Bring me the money. How much money? Fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand? I may need more. Make it a hundred. It's nothing. I understand this package is worth millions. But I... I'll sink you with me, Perry. 
I'll confess this part of it to the police. Oh, you can't prove it. What do I have to prove? At my trial, I'll insist you killed him for the drugs. The jury won't believe you. Oh, Oh, but your friends will. So, do you get me the money? Margaret, I... A good lawyer gets me a light sentence. You save your own life. It's the best deal you can get. Oh, (laughs) poor Perry. You really didn't want to kill him. But you were in so deep, you couldn't help it. You're not really a killer. Scoundrel, yes, but a killer, no. How was it, Perry? Hmm? How? (laughs) Come on. You have to tell it to someone, and you can trust me. What made you do it? He laughed at me. You know, Wilson. Yes. Yes, he only turned his back on me and he dismissed me. The way he dismissed me. Oh, I was furious. I saw that long, sharp letter opener lying on the floor, but I was cool enough to know what I was doing. I picked it up with my handkerchief, not not to get any fingerprints, and I... What? What did you do? I... I plunged it into his back. Oh, I'm going to be ill. Catch her. She's going to faint. Catch her. Who are you? Margaret, who is he? Oh... Permit me to introduce you. Perry Gulliver, may I present Lieutenant Toplinger of the New York City Police? I shall return shortly with a final thought. The name of our story is Everybody Does It, and thus is formed the heart and spirit of our morality. For what is morality? It comes from the word mores, which means custom, usage. And so the hard fact is, we are what we do. What society sometimes approves of or winks at. A pity we cannot be that to which we aspire. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Carol Titel, and Earl Hammond. Associate Director... Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. E.G. Marshall. Are you old enough and were you lucky enough to have been raised on A Child's Garden of Verses by Robert Louis Stevenson? If so, you must remember the one that began, I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me, and what can be the use of him is more than I can see. Well, in the musings of the very young, a shadow may seem a superfluous, if delightful thing, But in the world of parapsychology, the shadow is full of significance, mysterious, and arcane. In the morning on sunny days, there was my shadow walking ahead of me. And in the afternoon, if I looked over my shoulder, there it was right behind me. But then, this wondrous thing happened. And after that... My shadow was with me on the rainy days, too, and indoors, not only outdoors. In the dark, just as much as in the light. It's here, even now. After all that's happened, my shadow is right here. Our mystery drama, The Sinister Shadow was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There are 23 separate definitions of the word shadow in Webster's International Dictionary. If you wish, you may read them all. But for our immediate purpose, we have selected definition number eight. 
a reflected image as in a mirror or in water. Listen carefully to what follows, and you will understand why we selected this definition. I'll tell you how it all started. I mean, that is, if you're interested. Sure, I'm interested. I don't know why you should be. Well, I am. It would kind of help me to clear up the whole thing in my head. So tell me. Uh, it was the darndest thing. I was on my way home from the bank. Uh, I'm a teller at the bank. It doesn't pay much, but it's a, you know, a respectable kind of job. Not like some, you know. Sure. But I was walking east on Lake Street. It was about 3.30, and I was looking at my shadow... See, I always walk with my head down. It's a terrible habit, but anyhow, that's the way I generally walk. And for some reason, I heard my mother's voice the way I'd heard it about a million times. Stand up straight, for heaven's sake. She was always saying that to me. Dory, for heaven's sake, stand up straight. Don't slump. Dory, don't slump, she'd say. Throw your shoulders back. Stand erect. Stand erect, Dory. Throw your shoulders back, Dory. Oh, how many times I'd heard her say that. Yeah? Then what? Well, I looked at my shadow and... <laughs> my goodness, I looked like a dwarf or something. I could hardly see my head at all. And I didn't seem to have any shoulders. So... So? So, I straightened up. I threw my shoulders back, and I pulled in my stomach, and I held my head high, and I started taking long steps, swinging my arms. And? And I walked that way for, oh, half a block, maybe. But then I looked down at my shadow. And? My shadow. My shadow still looked like a dwarf. All hunched over, no head showing, hardly any shoulders. You believe me, don't you? Whatever you say. Well, you can imagine how surprised I was. Sure. I mean, there I was, standing erect, and my shadow was all hunched over. I couldn't understand it. I, I was I was flabbergasted. Naturally. Now, it so happened that I was standing right in front of a bar and grill. Now, I'm not in the habit of going into those places, but I was so... I, I was really shook up. Sure you were. So I went in. It seemed like a nice place. There were not very many people. After all, it was the middle of the afternoon. Uh-huh. And I didn't know if, if to sit at a table or what. I really didn't know what I was doing there exactly. But then, I saw a woman sitting at the bar. She was by herself, too. I'd heard that women do that these days, or I read it somewhere. So I thought, well, I'll go and I'll sit next to her. That way nobody will think I'm trying to pick up a man, you know. Uh-huh. So I hopped up on the stool next to her, and I just sat there, wondering what had happened to my shadow. Excuse me. Hmm? What? Uh-oh. Were you speaking to me? I think the bartender wants to know what you want to drink. Oh. Uh, what are you drinking? I'm having a glass of white wine. Oh, well, I'll have that. She'll have a glass of white wine. People seem to be drinking that a lot these days. <sighs> it's fashionable. Uh, a glass of white wine sounds very ladylike. Yes, I guess it does. It shows right away you're not a drunken dame. <laughs> I guess so. On the other hand, you're not a prude. Not above lifting one on occasion. Oh, here's yours. Shall we? What? Lift one. Oh, sure. To the future. Whatever it is. You like it? Oh, what? Like the wine. Oh, yes. I've, uh... I've had wine before. Several times. I'd never have guessed. Oh, beer, too. No fooling. Oh, yes. Uh, look, uh, um... Am I bothering you? You want me to shut up? No, no, no. I talk too much sometimes. I can't seem to help it. I just go on and on, and it drives some people crazy. I can't seem to stop myself. So just tell me. No, no, I'm... no. It's not that. It's just... You don't have to listen to me. No, I am listening. 
The way you keep staring in the mirror. That's just it. What is? What's it? Look in the mirror. Don't you see? See what? You and me. You and me. Side by side. So? We look alike. We do? Don't you see? You must see. We're doubles. Why, yes. So we are. It was true. We looked exactly alike, and when she really looked at me, she could see it, too. I, of course, nobody would notice it right away because, I mean, well, her clothes were very, very, uh, mod. Isn't that what they say? Mm, they used to. Well, she had on blue jeans, very tight, very, uh, well, revealing. Uh-huh. And then this top, kind of a magenta color, cut down to here. And these masses and masses of gold chains. And her hair... It was like light blonde, like mine, but all in tiny little curls. She told me later she'd had a permanent, but it certainly looked wonderful. Sort of lighted up her face, you know? Uh Uh-huh. Well, we got very friendly. Yes, we did. We really did. I told her all about what happened with my shadow, and she listened, and every once in a while she nodded her head and acted like she believed every word I was saying. Really? Well, sure. I've always heard that everybody has a double somewhere in the world, but I've never met mine. Have you met yours? No, I haven't. Well, wait till you do. It will change your whole life. It certainly changed mine. Certainly has. I I told her all about my mother, about hearing my mother's voice. You know, stand up straight, Dory. Don't slump, Dory. She understood that, too. It was really amazing. I can imagine. All of a sudden, I realized I'd been sitting there for almost an hour going on and on about all these things, and my mother must be wondering what on earth had become of me because, well, usually I come straight home from the bank, and it was almost five o'clock. Yeah. So? So I, I knew I'd get holy heck for being late because I always have to get the dinner. Uh, my mother does the shopping, but... I get the dinner. So I jumped up all of a sudden and said goodbye in a hurry and went out. But this time... This time... Yeah? This time? This time I walked with my head up and my shoulders back. I stood up very tall and took long steps. And? And this time... My shadow was very tall, too. My shadow held up its head and took long steps all the way home. Dory, it's me. Where in the name of heaven have you been? Do you know what time it is? Nearly five o'clock. Where were you? I was detained. Detained? They detained you at the bank? Uh, not, Not at the bank. Then where? You never go anyplace that I know of. I just stopped to talk to somebody. Did you forget I have guests coming for dinner? Well, I guess I did. The Swensons are coming and the Morrisons. Oh, and the Morrisons' son, Gordon. I I think his name is. Remember him? I I don't know if I do. Well, he got married about ten years ago and moved out of town. But now he's getting a divorce. I thought maybe... Uh, look, I put the ham in the oven. I thought I'd better when you didn't show up. How big is it? Uh, Twelve pounds. Right, so eighteen minutes per pound. Is... At three fifty. No, no, you start at one fifty internal temperature. Well, you go take a look at it. No, in a minute. I. I want to tell you and about. Don't worry, you'll have to make the sauce. I have no conception. It is just prepared mustard and currant jelly. Well, you take care of it, Mother. I met somebody. On the way home. A man? You met a man? No. A a woman. Oh. Uh, Listen. About this Gordon Morrison. I understand his marriage wasn't too happy. Now, there weren't any children, so there won't be any trouble about the divorce. I believe he's a certified public accountant. Mother, I want to tell you about... He's moving back here to live. A good CPA never has any trouble getting established, so I'm told. Mother... He's just your age, Dory. Give a year or two. I wish you would listen Dory, to... Dory, what I am getting at is this is a chance 
for you. Oh, Mother. You're almost 36. I wish you would now, have dinner. Please, don't sit there like a lump. Please don't. Say things. Join in. Be a part of the conversation. Be animated. The dinner will be good. We know that. And I'll make sure they know you cooked it. You'll make spoon bread, won't you? Yes, sir. Uh... But you have to do more than that. You have to act like you're having a good time, like you're enjoying yourself. Do you understand? Yes. Maybe if you... if you took a drink. That often helps. I, I know it helps me. It helps most people. Now, do you think you could do that? I could do that. A cocktail, maybe. I think... Uh, I think maybe a glass of white wine... Maybe two. I sat there like a lump. Once in a while, I'd think of something to say about something, but by the time I got around to saying it, they were talking about something else, you know. I think I do. Of course, they raved about the food. I really am a good cook. I'll bet you are. But I was all shut up in a cocoon, sort of. I couldn't... Get out. Uh-huh. And I could feel my mother getting madder and madder and more disgusted with me. But I couldn't do anything about it. I didn't blame her. No? No, because to her, everything comes so easy, always has. She laughs a lot, smiles. She can talk about anything practically. The words just roll out of her mouth. She doesn't have to try to make an effort. It all just kind of comes naturally to her, and she can't see why it doesn't come naturally to me. You're shy. I I guess you could call it being shy. I don't know. I just get sort of paralyzed when I have to talk to people. I want to go away or die or something. You're talking to me. Oh, yes, but... But what? You know all about my double. Oh. Do you know what I did the very next day? I went out, and I had my hair cut short. Oh? And then I had a permanent. You like it, don't you? Sure. It's nice. Now I look exactly like her. I'm, uh, I'm going to bring you a comb. You can run it through those pretty blonde curls. Why? Do I look awful? No, you don't look awful at all. But you could stand a little sprucing up. Okay. You'll be going upstairs in a little while. You'll want to look your very best for that. It's important. How would you feel if suddenly you came face to face with someone who looked exactly like yourself? How would you react? Would you advance happily thinking, why, what an attractive person? Or would you back off a bit thinking, what a loathsome creature? Not knowing what my own immediate response would be, I am content that my double should go his way while I go mine, and that we should be destined never to meet. I'll be back with Act Two. said before that in case I do have a double, that there actually is another E.G. Marshall roaming the earth, I hoped that we would never meet. But fate has a way of ignoring our hopes, and that has set me to wondering, if we did meet, we two, would we get along? Would I like him? Would he like me? Or would we dislike each other intensely and even become enemies? I think I'll return to my first position... Let him go his way. I'll go mine. You really like my hair this way? I really do. It's exactly like hers. You just need to run a comb through it. Well, you said you'd bring me one. I will. How about the blue jeans? You don't think I look silly in them? No, not a bit. My mother thought they were okay. She liked them. She liked my haircut, too. That's nice. No, not really. Why not? She had the wrong idea entirely. She didn't understand. You see, I couldn't tell her about meeting my double. You couldn't? Well, no. 
It was such a remarkable thing. I I wasn't sure she'd believe me. Maybe she would have. Oh, no, no, no. She hardly ever believed me about anything. And she'd never believed I'd met my double. And if I told her, she might try to do something about it. Like what, for instance? Well, forbid me to see her, for one thing. But you're 36 years old. Oh, that wouldn't have made any difference to my mother. No, she would have found a way. Like what? Oh, I don't know. And it was very important to me to be able to see my double. I saw her every day. You did? In the same bar and grill, sitting on those same two stools, drinking white wine. Oh, it was lovely, you know? Uh-huh. The only thing was, it made me late getting home. And my mother didn't like that. Not one bit. Dory? It's me. Do you realize it's five o'clock? It is? Yes, it is. I suppose the bank detained you. I was detained. But not by the bank? No, not by the bank. Well, who then? Who detained you? Dory, are you seeing somebody behind my back? Uh, what'd you get for dinner? A chopped meat. Enough for a meatloaf? Dory, are you seeing a man? I need two pounds for a meatloaf. Who is he? Somebody at the bank? No. Well, where did you meet him? You never go any place. You didn't pick him up on the street, did you? No. Girls do that all the time these days. I am not a girl. You just better bet you're not. Listen, Dory, if he's a nice man, you know how much I want you to meet a nice man. I know. Nothing could make me happier. And with your new haircut and those jeans and that top, well, there's no reason why you shouldn't meet some nice man. And where are you going? I'm going to make the meatloaf. I want to know who this man is. I want to know where you met him. And I want to know where you see him every afternoon. Why don't you see him in the evening? Is he married? Is that why? Are you seeing a married man on the sly? No. Then why don't you bring him home here so I can meet him? What is he, some kind of crook? No. Then what's wrong with him that your own mother can't meet him? Mother, I am not going to discuss this with you anymore. I'm going to make the meatloaf. I couldn't explain to her. She'd have wanted to meet my double. And that would have spoiled everything. Why? Well, because when you have a double, it's a... a very strange thing. It's not something you share with anybody. It's very personal and private, and it's not something you talk about. Not even to your own mother, especially to your own mother. It's your secret. Your very own secret. Your most precious secret. I... I don't know how to explain it to you if you don't know. That's all right. But you see, she kept after me and after me every day when I came home from the bar and grill. It got worse. She said she'd have me followed. She'd hire a detective and have me followed. She said she'd report me to the bank manager. She said she'd throw me out of the house. She'd everything. And every day it got worse and worse till I could hardly stand it. If it hadn't been for my double and seeing her every day... I think I'd have gone crazy. But you see, I could talk to her about it, and she would be very sympathetic, and we'd drink our white wine, and I'd feel better, and I'd go home. But it was always the same thing as soon as I got there. Oh, get in here. What's the matter? I watched you coming down the street. What for? You're a whole different person, you know that? I know. You don't walk all slumped over the way you used to. You hold your head up. You're 36 years old and all of a sudden you walk like a human being. Now, what I want to know is what is the cause of all this? Or should I say, who's the cause of it all? I know you get out of the bank 3.30 at the latest. You've been getting home later and later, 5, 5.30. Now, Dory... I know perfectly well you are not walking around by yourself or sitting in the library. Because I smell liquor on your breath. You spend your time drinking with somebody. Just a little white wine. I never get drunk. You've never seen me come home drunk. 
two little glasses of white wine and that's all. I never said you got drunk. I said you spent an hour, an hour and a half drinking with somebody. Now I'm sick and tired of asking you who it is you're meeting on the slide. I'm your mother and I have a right to know. Now you look me straight in the eye and tell me who it is. Dory? Who is it? Just somebody. I know it's somebody. I want to know what somebody. It's nobody we know because I've asked all you over town. You asked people? Well, how else am I going to find out? Not that I found out anything. A couple of people said they saw you go into the bar and grill on Lake Street a few times, but they never saw you with anybody. You asked people about me? Well, who do you meet in that bar and grill? Dory, are you going to tell me? I'll have to shake it out of you. Tell me, don't let me go. I'll let you go and you tell me. Now, who is it? My double. It's my double. You... You what? Everybody has a double. Most people don't meet theirs, but I did. She was sitting at the bar. What? What did you just say? She was sitting at the bar. You've been meeting a woman? We look exactly alike. You mean we... to stand there and tell me you've been getting drunk every day with a woman? Not drunk. A man, a maybe. A glass of wine. Oh, but this is crazy. It is not. It's weird. No, she's my double. She's like a twin, only it's better. She's wicked. That's what she is. She is not. Don't say that. And so are you. Don't say that or I'll kill you. To think that my daughter... I swear I'll... My very... Shut up, daughter! I will kill you! I was shaking all over. I was so angry. Sure you were. To think my own mother, my very own mother, would say such things about me. That she would even think them. It was horrible. Of course. And talking about her that way, was she, she'd never even met her, never even seen her. Uh-huh. She knew that I, I'd never... She knew me. She knew I would never, never... Uh, she should have known anyway. I understand. I... I got away from her and I ran out of the house. I couldn't possibly have stayed there. I just couldn't because... When I said I'd kill her, I meant it. I really did. I didn't know how I'd do it. But I knew I'd do it if I stayed there. So I ran out of the house. She was still standing in the doorway, screaming at me, saying awful things. I just ran, ran down the street. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't have any idea where to go. I just ran. And all of a sudden, I was on Lake Street... In front of the bar and grill. And there she was. Your double? Yes. I could see her through the window. She was sitting at the bar just the way I'd left her. Oh, maybe an hour before. And there she was with a glass of wine in front of her. And oh, I was so relieved to see her. The only person in the entire world I could talk to. So I opened the door. And I went in. Oh, oh, you're still here. What's the matter? Oh, I'm so glad. Oh, sit down. You're, you're all out of breath. Yes, I've been running all over town. Oh, sit down. You want some wine? I don't think so. Oh, here, drink the rest of mine. I thought you'd probably left by now. I left when you did, but I came back. You must have known I'd need you. Oh, listen. I had the most awful row with my mother. What about? You know she's been trying to find out who I've been seeing after banking hours. Yes, I know. And she's kept after me and after me. She thought I'd picked up with some man, some disreputable man that I was ashamed to bring home so she could meet him. And and she said she'd hire a detective. You told me. And this time she said she'd been asking all over town different people if they'd seen me with anybody. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's like opening my mail, reading my private letters... I simply could not believe she'd do a thing like that. And then she grabbed hold of me by the arms. And she started to shake me hard. And she hurt me and she wouldn't let me go. She said she'd shake the truth out of me. Yes? I had to make her stop. So I told her. 
I said it was you. Yes? Oh, not your name, because I don't know your name, but I said I was meeting my double, that everybody has a double, and I was so lucky that I had met mine. Yes? And then she really started to scream at me. She said I was wicked, and you were wicked, and crazy, and weird. And when she said that, it was like the top of my head just blew off. And I yelled back at her. I told her. I told her to shut up or I'd kill her. Yes, I said that. And oh, I meant it. It's all right, really. And I would have if I hadn't gotten out of there. Really, it, it's, it's all right. And if I go back there, I will. There's no need to do that. I've already killed her myself. She was so calm when she said it. I've already killed her myself. She said it like it was nothing. Uh-huh. And the peculiar thing was, it made me feel like it was nothing, too. Really? Yes. It seemed perfectly natural, perfectly logical. Like she'd done the only sensible thing. Then what? Well, we sat there and drank a little more wine and talked some very quietly. And then I came here. You did the right thing. I hope so. Absolutely. Say, I told you I'd bring you a comb and I haven't done it. Why don't I go fetch one now? Oh, don't leave me. I'll be right I back. I don't want to be alone. This is the first time I've told anybody and I don't want to be alone. Well, it won't take a minute. Please. Then you can fix yourself up a little before I take you upstairs. A most efficient double, wouldn't you say? One capable of strong, direct, even violent action. And at the same time, able to bring peace of mind and serenity and the conviction that everything has been for the best. Now, if I could be sure of having a double like that... Oh, but no. So far, I don't think I want to take the chance. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. I said before that I still do not wish to meet my double. But now it occurs to me, were I to meet him, would I recognize him? Offhand, you'd say, of course. How could you fail to recognize a replica of yourself? But consider this. Do I really know what I look like? I think I do. It's a very familiar face. But have I ever really seen it? Is it possible ever to see it? I'm not sure that it is. Thank you for the comb. Don't mention it. See that you use it. Oh, I will. Right now. We'll be going upstairs in about 20 minutes. So fix yourself up, you hear? What's upstairs? You'll see. I wonder what's upstairs. I wonder... Hello, Dory. Oh. Oh, it's you. How are you? I was just going to comb my hair. It needs it. Nobody told me you were here. Nobody knows. Are you glad to see me? I think so. You're not sure? What about my mother? What about her? How did you do it? I think I hit her with a chair. Don't you know? You know that little chair that stands in the front hall just to the left of the door? Yes. I picked that up and I held it up high and then I brought it down hard on the top of her head. Yes, that's what I did. I could never have done that. And then I choked her, just to make sure. You did? Really? Then when I was quite sure she was dead, I went back to the barn grill. You didn't even seem upset or anything. Well, why should I have been? It was the only thing to do. I suppose There so. was no other way out. Huh? Just the same, to kill a person. People get killed all the time. People kill people all the time. Not people I know. Just the same it happens. 
I guess so. I know I read about it in the papers, but... So why shouldn't it happen to you? To my mother, you mean. I didn't do it. No, of course you didn't. I did. That's right. Do you think I'm a terrible person because I did it? Well, when we were sitting in the bar and grill on Lake Street, you didn't seem to think I was so terrible. No. So why do you think I'm so terrible now? I don't know if I do. That's the way you're acting. You're being very critical. But she was my mother. Exactly. Sometimes... Sometimes I don't understand you at all. No? I thought we were double. We are. Then why don't I understand what you're saying? I don't know. It's really very exasperating. You're not mad at me? Not yet. I mean, you won't leave me. Not yet. Not ever. Don't leave me ever. Dory. What? What is it? I brought you some hot water. Now wash your hands and face. Haven't you combed your hair yet? Oh, I was just going to. Look, I'm putting this bowl of hot water down here. Now, there's a washcloth and a piece of soap. Use them. I will. Oh, before I forget. What are you doing? Taking down the mirror. What are you doing that for? Orders from upstairs. You're always talking about upstairs. What is upstairs? You'll find out soon enough. Are you mad at me? Do I sound mad? Kind of. Well, I'm not. Now you wash your face and hands before that water gets cooled off. I'm going to check and see when they'll be ready for you. Who? The people upstairs. Who are they? Look. They're very nice. Really. You don't have to be afraid of them. They mean well. They've got your best interests at heart. Believe me. Why would they want to take my mirror away? Just a precaution. They were afraid of what you might do. Do? I wouldn't do anything. No, of course you wouldn't. Then why... Better safe than sorry, and that's how they figure. Now listen, I'm going to go upstairs and check on how soon they'll be ready to see you. Meantime, you wash up, okay? Okay. I'll be back in a few minutes. What is she talking about? Am I going to do anything? Where's the soap? Oh, here. Hello. Oh. I thought you'd gone away. Not at all. Look, if I said anything to make you angry... You were very snippy. I was? How about my killing your mother? Well, after all... You're getting very holier than thou all of a sudden. I don't mean to. Sitting in the bar and grill, you seem very pleased at what I'd done. Yes. After all, I did it for you. She was your mother, not mine. I didn't know her from a hole in the wall. She meant absolutely nothing to me. She did to me. Oh, the way you talked, I'd never have guessed. That was just talk You wanted to kill her, you told me so. That was talk. Don't you understand? That was talk. Pretty serious talk. I would have never done it. Never. I wouldn't have. Of course you wouldn't have. That's why I did it for you. I'm going to tell them you did it. You are? You don't mind? What can they do to me? They will catch you. I'll tell them what you look like, and they'll go after you, and they'll catch you. What will you tell them I look like? Well, you... What do I look like? Come on. Take a close look. Now, tell me, what do I look like? You look... You look just like me. Of course. We're doubles. Okay, now, you ready? Because they're ready for you. What? You haven't even washed your face. No, I... The water's not even warm. Why did I go to all the trouble to bring you hot water? You're not going to throw it out? What good is it now? You haven't combed your hair either. What have you been doing while I was out of the room? My double was here. I was talking to her. Oh. Oh, I see, your double. Well, how did things go with your double... 
Not very well. Oh? In what way? We, uh... We had a kind of a quarrel. I see. We're not getting along. Look, it's time we were getting upstairs. So come on. You'll have to go as you are because they do not like to be kept waiting. You said the people upstairs, you said you, they were nice? They are. Basically, very nice. Now, come on. Turn right here. That's it. What will they do to me? They won't do anything. They'll just talk to you. And the stairs are straight ahead. We have to walk up. And, of course, they'll want you to talk to them. Come on, up we go. What will I talk to them about? Oh, it's almost anything. Anything you've got on your mind. Should I talk to them about my mother? If you feel like it. Should I tell them she's dead? If that's what you feel like telling them. I think I'll tell them that. Okay. And something else I'll tell them. What's that? I'll tell them who did it. It's one more flight up. Okay. You're going to tell them about... about your double? Yes. Definitely. I'm going to tell them she killed my mother. All right. You think it's okay to tell them that? I think it's exactly what you should tell them. Of course, if I tell them, I may not ever see her again. Oh? Why not? Well, when you were out of the room and I was talking to her, I got the feeling she didn't want me to tell anybody. Of course, I'd already told you, but you wouldn't tell, would you? Certainly not. She said she did it for me. Uh Uh-huh. And I understand that. But I didn't ask her to. Did I? Look, here we are. This is the room. They're waiting for us. I'm scared. I I don't want to go in. Now, there's nothing to be afraid of. But I don't know these people. They're very nice. Really. You'll like them. No, I won't, and they won't like me. Yes, they will. They think I killed my mother. And they'll ask me all about it, and it'll be awful. No, I don't want to do it. Dory, stop it. Now you just stop it. I know, I won't do it. (laughs) You hit me. You hit me. I want you to listen to what I have to say. Listen to me carefully. Do you understand? Yes. You are going into that room with me, and you are going to tell those people in there exactly what you told me. Start to finish. Got that? I can't. Those people in there are doctors, Dory. They want to help you. They're not... policemen? Whatever gave you the idea they were policemen? I just thought... Well, you thought wrong. And there's something else I'm going to tell you. Something I'm not supposed to tell you because I'm just a nurse here. But I'm going to tell you anyway. There are three doctors in that room. Two are men and one's a woman. And there is some possibility that there'll be another woman in there with them. Your mother. My mother's dead. Your mother is not dead. My double, she killed her. She hit her over the head with a chair, and then she choked her. She did it for me. My mother's dead. Your mother is very much alive, and there isn't a mark on her. Now, are you ready to go in there? Okay. Wait a second. Look at your shadow. All hunched over. Aren't you ashamed? That's it. No, you're standing tall. And your shadow is, too. All right, Dory. Go on in. Nobody is going to hurt you. you know, Dory's double lived in her shadow. Then, in her image reflected from the big mirror behind the bar, 
Later, a reproduction of herself in the small hospital mirror where she combed her hair. And finally, her own face seen in a bowl of water. So she got a glimpse of a second self. Strong and competent. And possessing the capacity for rage. Even murder. I'll be back shortly. Yes, theoretically, an earthquake of a certain intensity at the right place could carry the state of California into the sea. Read Goodbye, California by Alistair McLean, the story of a fanatical terrorist whose ability to detonate an atomic bomb gives him the ultimate blackmail weapon, earthquake. An earthquake so monstrous it could mean goodbye, California. The authorities are helpless, but one man alone, a super cop driven by a personal motive, races to meet the terrorist head on. A race that must be won, or else it's goodbye, California. Read Goodbye, California by Alistair McLean. A story of daring, danger, and the threat of a doomsday that could happen tomorrow. If you enjoy suspense, get set for a thrilling experience because you are going to live that experience in Goodbye, California by Alistair McLean. Now in paperback from Fawcett. I do believe that I have a double and that he and I have a rendezvous somewhere, sometime. And he will have qualities I never suspected in myself. Some pleasant, perhaps. Perhaps others very, very unpleasant indeed. I wonder, am I ready for this encounter? Not today, no. Maybe tomorrow or the next day or the day after that or, well... Someday. Our cast included Terry Keene, Grace Matthews, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I keep telling myself it's a lover's quarrel. They'll make up and everything will be all right. Yeah, well, that's not what Susan says. It's off, over, finished. I asked, did he give any reason? And she just shook her head and went up to her room to cry. Listen, I'm not hanging around this town any longer. Everything about it gives me the creeps. My sister gets kicked in the teeth and my pop says, well, well. Well, I don't see it that way. She can't protect herself. But I am not letting that guy get away with it. All right. All right, Mayor Greeley. I'm coming, I'm coming. What? Well, Harry... What are you doing here at 5.30 in the morning all dolled up in your police chief's outfit? You would better get yourself dressed, Horace. And hurry. Well, would you mind telling me why? There's been a murder. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. As the centuries go marching by in review, head and shoulders above the rest of us march the great innovators, the scientists, the inventors. Their names are blazoned large in the annals of the world. Newton, Euclid, Da Vinci, Einstein, navigators, astronauts, explorers, but some who have opened new paths to mysterious realms go past unnoticed. For example, Herbert Boggs, whose strange and unique story I bring you now. Herb, <clears throat> what do you mean, read? Well, it's hard to explain, Sadie. But you know, ever since I was shocked by that electricity, it's like, uh... Like written, up there in my mind. Like I was printed on a notice board. I, 
can read the future, Sadie. Like it was, uh, the first page of tomorrow's newspapers. Our mystery drama, The Shock of His Life, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Larry Haynes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. If you were to pick the most unlikely spot for a miracle that could bottle modern science, you couldn't do better than Elmhurst in the borough of Queens, New York City, or a more unlikely man for it to happen to than Herbert Boggs. Herb is an average middle-class man in a crowd most likely to go unnoticed. He's been married to Sadie for 35 years. Two children, grown and married, he has his own little bar and grill, and his interests are beer, boxing, football, and the ponies. He also likes the comics. Hey, Sadie, look. Look at this here. What? Sparkman. See how he handles them creatures from outer space? Which one is he? The fella in the union suit? Oh, Sadie, that ain't no union suit. That's his uniform, like. Well, why would a grown-up man want to wear a kid outfit like that? Because, because it frees his muscles to do things. Oh, what's the sense explaining to a woman? Herbie, what are them zigzaggy things sticking out of his hands? Oh, that, that, that's his electrostatic ray. He hits you with that and zingo, you're static. It's like electricity. Oh, he must run up some utility bills. Oh, come on. What do you say, D? He ain't hooked up to the electric company. That's like his own electric power. Oh, in the comics, anything can happen. But it ain't for real. Oh, yeah. Well, don't you kid yourself, Sadie. You'd be surprised how many real scientific ideas come straight out of the comics. That, that's, that's how it's a real education to read them. Need, you know, these guys who draw them are geniuses, most of them. Yeah, well, well, honey, why don't you get me a beer, huh? Well, why don't you get it for yourself? Well, can't you see I'm turning the game on? You know I always watch the football games on Sundays. All right, Herbie. You have your day of rest. But, honey, don't turn it up too loud. Yeah, all right. No louder than I have to hear what's going on, okay? Well, I don't have to hear... Oh, you're in the Oh, Oh, Don, the picture, the picture, Blue. Put, uh, put the beer down someplace, huh? You mean something's happened to that, too? Well, you got eyes, ain't you? We got the, we got the sound, but no picture. Uh, Herbie, what are you doing? I'm going to get the back off. I can fix this thing. I, I can't miss the game. You can't fix it. You need a TV man. What, a 33 bucks a crack? Anyway, where are you going to find one on a Sunday, huh? Well, you shouldn't mess around, Herbie. It's dangerous. Well, what's the difference? You can still hear. I don't want to just hear. I want to see. You better not shove your hand in there. Oh, I can see already there's a tube half lying there. It just needs to be stuck back in. I read in a paper where it said a person should never... Ah, ah. Ah. something to me. Answer me. Herb. Herb. Now, what did you say happened to your husband, Mrs. Uh... It, it's Boggs, Doctor. Oh, yes, Boggs. Well, he was fooling around trying to fix the TV. While it was turned on? Yes. And he got a shot. Oh, yes. He just went down like a rag doll. Only when I kneeled beside him on the floor, he was... He was all stiff-like. Mm -hmm. Did he have any pulse? I don't know. I, I didn't stop to find out. I just called the police. But after, when you went back to him? I don't know. I didn't think to try. Was he breathing? I don't think so. That's what scared me so, Doctor. He was laying there just like a corpse. Stiff, like I said. How long... Pardon? How long was he lying there in that condition? Oh, I wouldn't know. For a while. And then, I, after I, I got him on his back with the pillow under his feet and all, then I could hear him a little, sort of, like, you know, snoring. 
the way he was when you first got here. But you can't estimate how long it was before you heard him making that sound. Oh, I was so scared. I, I mean, every second was like a year. And, well, well, maybe five minutes, ten. Is it going to be all right, Doctor? We have him breathing clearly now, and we're going to take him right down to the hospital. Oh, um, do you have a car? Oh, no. You uh, want to come along? Oh, yes. Couldn't I sit with Herb and hold his hand? I uh, think you'd better let me and the medic do that, Mrs. Boggs. Oh. You climb in with the driver. All right. Okay, Hank, open up the hooders and get us to the hospital fast. We don't want to arrive with a DOA. <laughs> Sorry to keep you waiting so long, Mrs. Boggs. Herb, how is he? Well, at the moment, his condition is stabilized. His respiration is satisfactory, he's out of cardiac arrest, and his EKG is normalizing. What does that mean, Doctor? Well, Mrs. Boggs, when you called police emergency, we got to you as fast as possible. But there was a period after your husband sustained the electric shock during which we don't know his medical condition. But you said he was breathing and all again. Yes, his condition now is stable enough. What we don't know, Mrs. Boggs, is what may have happened to him in the period after he sustained the shock until we arrived and could start treatment. Doctor, I don't mean to be stupid. I I just don't quite follow you. Well, let me try to explain. When we have sudden shock, like an electrical one, which stops normal functions such as breathing and heartbeat, time is of the essence. I won't go into all the complications and technical terms, but if, through shock, a patient loses all cardiopulmonary functions for more than four to six minutes, well, then we're in deep trouble. You mean my herb would die? Not necessarily. What I do mean is that he could suffer irreversible brain damage and change. Oh, you think that That's what could have happened before you got to our apartment? Well, I honestly don't know. Mr. Boggs is still in a coma until he comes out of it. And we've had a chance to evaluate the EKG and other tests. I can't give you any definite answer. I'm sorry. But you don't think he's going to die? I um, can't even promise you that. I know it's little comfort, but perhaps if the damage has already been done, it might be better for him and for you. I want him to come, too. I want him back. Well, of course you do, Mrs. Boggs, and I want you to have hope. But I also ask you to wait and see. The man you get back could very easily be as different from night and day as the husband that you remember and love. Good morning, Herbie. Sadie, where am I? Where should you be when you're sick? The hospital. Hospital? What am I doing here? Don't you remember? You were messing around with that TV. Like Mike, who comes to fix it. Didn't Mike warn you? What? Well, he said, you you know, never touch in the back without you pull the plug. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I remember. Hey, who won? Who won what? The game. What game? The game, the game that was going on when the set pooped out. Well, how should I know? You think I should care about football players when my husband was lying like dead? What husband? You. Herbie, you went and electrocuted yourself. How come you're in the hospital? Waking up like this, I couldn't figure. I never... I never felt better in my life. Oh, we'll let the doctor decide No, that. what do I need a doctor for? I know how I feel. I want to get out of here and go home. Now, just a minute. No, just a minute. Get my pants, Sadie. I don't belong here. Herb, you've been sick. Real sick. Two days you've been laying there like dead. You can't go home unless the doctor signs you out. All right, so get him and have him. I can't do that. He thinks you might have... Well... You know, with the electric shock and all. No, I don't know. Like I say, I feel like a million bucks. Now, I need out. I got things to do. What things? Well, like, I can't... I can't explain that there are things going on in my head. Now, honey, I don't care about rules and regulations. I'm getting out of here. Doctor or no doctor. Herbie, you got to have him to get out. And how am I going to convince him? Oh, he's going to let me out without any trouble. How do you know? Well, I can read it. It's that simple. Read it? What do you mean, read it? 
In my brain. In my brain, Sadie. Just like I can read so many other things now. Now, just trust me, huh? Like you always did. Gee, Herb. I want to. I want to with all my heart. But... Oh, it's... It's all so kind of different. I, I don't know where I'm at. You don't have to worry about where you're at, Sadie. Just get yourself set for where we're going. Now that we've been struck by lightning. Oh, boy. Good to be home. I just don't understand. After all he said, the doctor didn't make any problem about your coming home. Oh, why should he, Sadie? I'm in better shape than he is. Get me a beer, hon. Huh? Oh, sure, Herbie, if you say so. You want a glass? Uh, 32 years married, you ask me that? When did I ever use a glass? Are you sure the doctor wouldn't... Sadie, what do I care about the doctor? I know what's good for me. And for you. Here, just let me show you. Who are you calling? Of course. The bookie? Yep, that's him. Now look, Herb. We ain't got money to take flyers. I mean, like after the hospital and ambulance and all, you know? No, I don't know. And who says this is a flyer? This is something I gotta get through your head. Uh, hello? Horse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Herb. Yeah. You know, Herb Boggs? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Listen, uh, you're holding some winnings for me. Um, 120 bucks, right? Yeah, that's, a, that's all right. You check your books. It's there. Yeah, well, listen, I want to take a little flutter. Now, uh, you got notable gaffer in the first going off a of ten to one, right? Ah, and uh, Pleasure Sky in the fourth, 70 to 1. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I want to parlay them on the nose to win. Yeah, yeah, the whole bundle. Are you crazy? Herb, you had winnings of over a hundred dollars, and you're betting them on a daily double with two outsiders? Honey, honey, not to worry. I can't lose. What do you mean you can't lose? I already read the results, clear and simple, the way the things are from here in. What do you mean, read? Well, it's hard to explain, Sadie, but ever since I took that, that belt of electricity, it's like, it's like written up there in my mind, like, like, I, like it was printed on a notice board. I, I can read the future. Like, like it was the uh, first page of tomorrow's newspaper. So, as Herb, or should I say, like Herb would say, here is a miracle happening right in that western end of Long Island. Has that extra amount of electricity Herb Boggs's body accidentally absorbed brought about some strange physiological or psychological change? Or has it, as Dr. Barnes fears, caused some profound and irreparable damage that gives him delusions? Mystery Theater will return shortly with Act Two. Now, here is Herbert Boggs, owner of a small local bar and grill, who is suddenly electrified and claims to be able to see, in his mind's eye, the front page of tomorrow's newspaper. It is also a fact that the electrical shock was of such severity that it put him into cardiac arrest and eliminated all his vital signs for an indefinite period. A period, however, which may have been long enough to cause irreparable damage. Herb, why don't you take a nice rest in your armchair and let me fetch your slippers? Oh, Sadie, will you stop acting like I went round the bend? I'm telling you the truth. That you could see into the future? Well, not the whole future, just like I could see what could be on the front page of a paper. The racing results? Well, if, uh, if someone won big enough to get a headline, and other things do... I'm, I'm just telling you the way it is, Sadie. Maybe I'd better get you some aspirin. Will you, for crying out loud, stop treating me like I had some kind of a sickness or something? I got vision right here. How can you be sure? It's just I am, Sadie, I am. All right, we can prove it out. Wait a minute. What are you doing? I'm calling the number. What number? There's this number you call to check the betting results. Couldn't you just listen in on the radio? Well, of course I could listen. This is faster. 
Yeah, here, like already I'm getting the rundown. About the horse race, the parley? No, 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 he's isn't up to that now. He's on basketball and football right now. Oh. oh, wait, 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 here he goes on exactors and perfectors and all that. No. Hey, now, wait a minute. What? Here, here he goes on results of big oval track. First race. Notable gaffer wins at 10 to 1. <laughs> 